committee will come to order. Without objection, the committee re may recess at any point. Good morning, Secretary Americus, and thank you for joining the committee to discuss the budget that you and President Biden have put forward for the Department of Homeland Security. On March 1st, the department celebrated its 21st anniversary, and I want to thank all the public servants throughout DHS who dedicate their lives to securing the homeland. This work is vital to our nation's safety and security. Mr. Secretary, when you took the oath of office, you swore to, quote, support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office, end quote. The Immigration and Nationality Act further makes clear that you have a, quote, duty to control and guard the borders, the boundaries and borders of the United States, end quote. During your three years as secretary, you have failed to fulfill this oath. You've refused to comply with the laws passed by Congress, and you've breached the public trust. You've facilitated and encouraged record levels of illegal immigration since your first day in office, and we've all witnessed the devastating results of your open borders agenda. I've shared this before, but I feel it's necessary to repeat it. You abolished working policies, and following the statements of your boss on his campaign trail, promises to improperly grant asylum to anyone who came. As a result, people from all over the world tested the system. They came and were released, they phoned home, and the mass waves began. With this increased demand, the cartels took advantage, regulated that flow to overwhelm the crossing sites at our border. You responded by removing the Border Patrol agents from the border, marshals from the air, customs agents from airports, to process and release these record numbers of people and issued guidance to DHS law enforcement to violate laws passed by this co-equal branch of government, Congress, on detention and removal. With the border wide open and Border Patrol occupied processing the mass waves of people, the cartels have poured drugs, criminals, and trafficked humans into this country. This has led to the deaths of thousands, the loss of billions of dollars, and created the crisis that you just finally acknowledged as such in recent testimony. Even your counterpart, the FBI Director Christopher Wray, has said there's no way to ensure Hamas and other terrorists are not a part of the roughly two million gotaways who've entered our country uncaught on your watch. And the massive increase in Chinese nationals, 53,000 encountered in 23, adds to the threats we now face at home because you chose not to enforce the law. Your refusal to follow those laws is contemptible. Your disregard of the requests from this co-equal branch of government in pursuit of our constitutional duty to conduct oversight, your false statements to this body and the American people, and your issuance of guidance to the employees of DHS telling them to violate laws passed by Congress shows a disregard for the Constitution you swore an oath to uphold. However, instead of acknowledging those failures and pledging to change course, your actions and directives remain unchanged. You've doubled down. This budget request reflects this obstinance. It fails to take seriously the crises threatening our national security interests, especially our wide open borders. For example, you request a $1.45 billion cut in top line spending for CBP's budget from what Congress enacted last year. That includes a $245 million cut in funding for CBP's border security operations budget. Instead, as you did in last year's budget, you propose a $4.7 billion slush fund called the Southwest Border Contingency Fund, which ironically would not be used to actually secure the border, but simply help you process and release more illegal aliens quickly into the interior. And might I remind you that our founders wanted the executive branch, if the founders wanted the executive branch to just get a slush fund, they would never have detailed the funding duties of this body in the division of power. Again, that's treading on the Constitution. And this fund won't solve the humanitarian crisis that you've created. It would facilitate it while trying to hide the truth from the American people. Your budget proposal only provides for 350 new Border Patrol agents. The Secure Border Act passed by this House in 23 provided enough funding for eight times that number. Your budget only requests funding for 34,000 ICE beds. And by comparison, in FY 2021, the previous administration requested 60,000 ICE beds at a time when illegal crossings were at their lowest in decades. Your targets for removals of illegal aliens are abysmal. In 2020, amid the COVID-19 pandemic, ICE removed 185,884 illegal aliens, while in, fi in fiscal year 19, ICE removed removals exceeded 267,000. 
Last year, despite more than 3.2 million inadmissible encounters at our border, you only accomplished around 143,000 removals. And in this budget, you're only targeting 125,000. At that rate, it would take 16 years to remove just the roughly 2 million gotaways on your watch, to say nothing of the more than 9 million encounters, many of whom have also been released. Meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party continues to carry out multifaceted covert espionage and influence missions against the United States. Beijing has shown that if we give an inch, they'll take a mile. And Mr. Secretary, you have given them all 1,951 miles of our southern border. While we're deeply appalled by your handling of the border security and immigration issues, this committee does look to work with the department on key issues. This past February, the administration issued an executive order providing for more stringent cybersecurity at our ports, as well as an emphasis on supply chain security. We support these initiatives. Your proposal also recognizes that our cyber workforce is vital to the protection of our homeland. Strengthening our cyber workforce pipeline will be one of the top priorities for the remainder of this year, and it is imperative that the 419 full-time employees you requested for cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency are utilized effectively. And to that end, we must ensure CISA's authorities and resources align with its mission. Secretary Mayorkas, the world is only growing more dangerous. Our adversaries in China, Russia, Iran, and elsewhere are expanding their capabilities and seeking to undermine our interests, even within our homeland. While parts of this budget request deal with some of those threats, the request as a whole fails to meet the important time we have. I now recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Thompson, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. I want to begin by thanking Secretary Mayorkas for being here today. Mr. Secretary, your testimony before the committee, despite the unfounded extreme mega attacks against you, speaks to your character, integrity, and commitment to the Department of Homeland Security, its mission, and its people. In what seems like a split screen day, this morning the committee is holding its annual hearing on the Department of Homeland Security's budget request. This afternoon, Republican members will deliver to the Senate their baseless articles of impeachment in perhaps the most politicized partisan stunt this committee has ever engaged in. From the moment the Secretary took office in February 2021, members of the other side of the aisle have unfairly targeted him for their own political gain. Chairman Green promised donors at a campaign event that he would be bring an impeachment case against Secretary Mayorkas. He told his contributors to get the popcorn and promised it's going to be fun. According to an internal Republican memo, Republicans had already scheduled a committee vote to impeach the secretary prior to holding a hearing. This entire thing was a sham from the start. After two hastily thrown together so-called impeachment hearings that provided not even a shred of evidence of an impeachable offense, Republicans short-circuited their own markup and refused to let Democrats offer amendments in their rush to the House floor. In advance of the vote, the secretary, who is Jewish and whose mother survived the Holocaust, was referred to using language the American Jewish Committee has included in its glossary of anti-Semitic terms. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record an article describing this incident. So ordered. The impeachment vote failed. In another embarrassing miscalculation of House Republican leadership, on a second try, Republicans limped their sham impeachment articles across the finish line. Over two months later, Republicans are still transmitting the impeachment articles to the Senate, having waited until they thought the timing was politically advantageous. So much for the claims of urgency about the border. They waited, they wanted to have a dog and pony show march into the Senate, showing yet again what deeply unserious people they are. The Senate should dismiss the baseless impeachment articles without delay. 
To make matters worse, in their zeal to impeach Secretary Mayorkas, Republicans have shirked their responsibility to conduct meaningful oversight of DHS and advance its many critical missions. Republicans have not yet held a single full committee oversight hearing on cybersecurity, domestic terrorism, aviation security, disaster preparedness and response, or election security, this Congress. Shocking for a committee born out of 9-11 attacks, which once had a reputation for rising above the partisan politics to help secure the homeland on behalf of the American people. The committee's legislative work has suffered too. By the time last, this, by this time last Congress, the committee had reported 49 measures, and that was during a global pandemic. This Congress, by contrast, the full committee has reported fewer than half that number. This is what happens when Republicans make someone who espouses political violence, pushes anti-Semitic tropes, and want to defund the FBI, the de facto leader of their party. This is what happens when Republicans prioritize the whims of extreme mega members over, over politics that serve the American people. It is chaos and dysfunction by design. If you don't believe me, just look at how long it took us to elect a speaker. Uh, we did nothing but vote uh, after vote after vote. And to add insult to injury, Democrats were accused of slowing things down. And we are the minority party. We're not in charge. If Republicans are looking for someone to hold accountable, they should start looking in the mirror. Through it all, Secretary Mayorkas has remained steadfast. He continues to do his job across the department's many critical homeland security missions, including border security and immigration enforcement. He's used the full range of authorities at his disposal and stretched the resources provided by Congress to secure the border. Under his leadership, the department has removed record levels of migrants, detained more people than Congress had provided funding for, and prevented unprecedented amounts of fentanyl from entering our communities. Republicans talk a lot about supporting border security, but you know, talk is cheap. If Republicans were serious about improving conditions along the border, they would provide the department the funding necessary to do so. Instead, the majority of committed Republicans, a dozen in fact, including the chairman, voted no on providing DHS the funds it needs to secure the border. Republicans have also refused to consider the border security supplemental funding the department requested months ago, starving DHS and its frontline personnel of the money they need to carry out their duties. Americans aren't fooled by these Republican political games. They understand that where you invest your resources speak to where, what you really value. If Republicans valued border security like they claim, they would pay for it. I want to hear Secretary Mayorkas today about the administration's budget requests for the Department of Homeland Security. I want to ask how we can support the department, its mission, and its 260,000 dedicated personnel. That is our responsibility, and it has one I know our Democratic members take seriously. Mr. Chairman, this committee can do better. It has done better under leadership from chairmen of both parties. I look forward to returning to better days on this committee. Uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields. Uh, other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted to the record. We are pleased to have Secretary Mayorkas here, and I would ask the secretary to please rise and raise his right hand.
Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the Committee on Homeland Security of the United States House of Representatives will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record reflect that the Secretary has answered in the affirmative. Thank you, sir. You may be seated. I'd now like to formally introduce our witness. Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is the seventh Secretary of Homeland Security, a role in which he served since February the 2nd, 2021. Prior to his appointment, he served as the Deputy Secretary of DHS and the Director of USCIS. I thank you for being here today, sir. The witness's full statement will appear in the record, and I now recognize uh, Secretary Mayorkas for five minutes to summarize his opening statement. Chairman Green, Ranking Member Thompson, distinguished members of this committee. Every day, the 268,000 men and women of the Department of Homeland Security carry out our mission to protect the safety and security of the American people. They protect our shores, harbors, skies, cyberspace, borders, and leaders. They stop fentanyl and other deadly drugs from entering our country. They lead the response to maritime emergencies. As we speak, they are engaged in the response to the tragic Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse in Baltimore. They help communities recover and re rebuild after a natural disaster. They combat the scourges of human trafficking, forced labor, and online child sexual exploitation, and so much more. All this despite a perennially insufficient budget. The dedicated public servants of DHS deserve full support, and the American people deserve the results a fully resourced DHS can deliver. The funding opportunities outlined in the President's fiscal year 2025 budget for DHS are critical to meeting both goals. I welcome the opportunity to discuss this proposed budget and highlight some of its key proposals with you today. When our department was founded in the wake of 9-11, the threat of foreign terrorism against high visibility targets was our primary concern. That foreign threat persists, but we now also confront the terrorism-related threat of radicalized lone offenders in small groups already resident here in the United States. This budget provides for an $80 million increase to our department's nonprofit security grant program and additional funds for targeted violence and terrorism prevention grants so that DHS can better help communities prevent tragedies from occurring. As lone actors in nation states increasingly target our critical infrastructure and our data, the president's budget provides CISA with needed funding to improve our cybersecurity and resiliency. Fentanyl is wreaking tragedy in communities across the country. DHS has interdicted more illicit fentanyl and arrested more, arrested more individuals for fentanyl-related crimes in the last two fiscal years than in the previous five combined. The President's budget includes critical funding to advance our strategy, including funds for non-intrusive inspection technology and targeted operations. During a time when the world, including our hemisphere, is experiencing the greatest displacement of people since World War II. DHS has toughened our border enforcement and is maximizing our available resources and authorities. In the last 11 months, we have removed or returned more than 630,000 individuals who did not have a legal basis to stay, more than in every full fiscal year since 2013. The President's budget would further expand these efforts. It provides funding for hiring more enforcement personnel and bolstering refugee processing. Our immigration system, however, is fundamentally broken. Only Congress can fix it. Congress has not updated our immigration enforcement laws since 1996, 28 years ago. And only Congress can deliver on our need for more Border Patrol agents, asylum officers, and immigration judges, facilities, and technology. Our administration worked closely with a bipartisan group of senators to reach agreement on a national security supplemental package, one that would make the system changes that are badly needed and give DHS the tools and resources needed to meet today's border security challenges. We remain ready to work with you to pass this tough, fair, bipartisan agreement. Finally, extreme weather continues to devastate communities. Last year, FEMA responded to more than 100 disasters. Our budget provides $22.7 billion to assist community leaders and help survivors in the aftermath of major disasters, and additional funds to invest in resilient strategies that will save lives and taxpayer money in the decades to come. Essential to our success across all mission sets is our department's ability to recruit and retain a world-class workforce. In addition to the frontline border workforce I mentioned, 
The President's budget includes $1.5 billion to main our commitment to fairly compensate the TSA workforce. The recently passed 2024 budget, though welcome and helpful to many of our operations, was enacted too late to implement an appreciable hiring surge. It reduced by 20% much needed support for cities dealing with migrant related challenges, and it cut critical research and development funding. I am eager to work with you to address these and other shortfalls in the weeks ahead, as I am eager to deliver the sustained funding, resources, and support that the extraordinarily talented and dedicated public servants of DHS need and deserve. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Members will be recognized by order of seniority for their five minutes of questioning. And I'd like to say the Secretary has, I think, a hard out today. Uh, and that hard out is uh, going to come up uh, much faster um, than we would want or desire. I understand he's got a busy schedule. Typically, my policy is to let people go beyond the five minutes if they're, if they're making a question uh, and continuing a train of thought. Unfortunately, today we're not going to be able to allow that, and I hate that. But as I've applied the rule evenly to both sides, I will now apply for today's hearing the five minutes with the gavel for both sides of the aisle. So it's five minutes and five minutes only because we want to allow everyone here to get an opportunity to ask questions of the secretary. And I'd like to ask the staffs on both sides if they would communicate this change for today uh, to the individuals who aren't present right now. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, you've issued guidance that uh, directed DHS personnel to essentially disregard the INA shall detain language, meaning, uh, you know, disregard the laws passed by Congress. You've created pathways for tens of thousands of migrants from very specific countries to enter the United States directly without any law passed by Congress and in violation of the INA. The Solicitor General, in arguments before the Supreme Court, arguing on your and your boss's behalf, as well as yourself in testimony to Congress, have said you've had prosecutorial discretion, I think is the term that, that keeps getting used, to disregard those laws when the resources are overwhelmed. So that's essentially been the argument that, um, you know, shall detain language could not be adhered to because the resources were overwhelmed. Is that generally correct? No, it is not. Mr. Chairman, let me assure you uh, that we enforce the laws that Congress has passed. And that is the direction that I have given uh, to the workforce throughout my tenure. Well, during the, during the uh, hearing or the uh, court trial, Texas versus the United States, the Solicitor General made it very clear that the reason the policies that you've written have been written the way they've been written is because there's some form of discretion allowed to make the choice that we're not going to, you know, follow the shall detain. And we, we can get thousands and thousands of examples of where that didn't happen. Um, we have a memorandum from you that basically says, uh, just because it says this doesn't mean you have to, that's a reason to not, or to detain someone. Um, it, I want to ask this question. Do you know how many ICE detention beds were empty on average during your tenure? Um, Mr. Chairman, let me uh, be very clear that we maximize the use of detention beds that are available. Sometimes we are curtailed by using detention beds by reason of you, orders, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Do, but do you orders, know the number? I'm, I'm just orders, kind of going for the number. By orders of court, for example, certain restrictions were used in terms of space and availability of beds by reason of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, let me, let me just uh, share what what has been put out in documents from your department. Uh, in each year of your tenure, there have been, I would submit thousands, well, there are thousands of beds available per day, roughly 9,000 on average in FY22, 3,000 a day in FY23, meaning while you assert that shall detain is what, what you want to do, what you agree the law says, we're leaving thousands of beds empty every day. And this is not counting the various, I think it's in California, starts with an A, I can't think of the name of the facility, where the courts have ordered you not to use those beds. We're not including those in these counts. And it's thousands, at, at, at least 3,000 a day empty, and yet the arguments before the Supreme Court 
and in your testimonies before here to Congress have been that the resources are overwhelmed and therefore we have to just catch and release these people into the country. I mean, in your opening statement, you said we need more resources. Um, it's interesting, though, in, those, in that claim for more resources so that we can adhere to the laws, you're actually, in this budget, decreasing the requested ICE detention beds. So that seems to me to, to be illogical. If the reason we can't enforce the laws as they're written on the books is because we don't have enough resources, there are thousands of empty beds, and we're going to ask for less beds in this budget. I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and, and I would submit to you that it's, it speaks to somewhat of an, an intent to not adhere to that shall detain. Uh, but I, I, you know, that's my, my percep perception on this. Um, let me ask you this question. Just recently, your last uh, trip here, you, you actually admitted that there was a crisis at the southwest border. What, what changed? Oh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, nothing changed. I have recognized the enormous challenge that the southern border presents ever since I began my tenure, and actually uh, well before that, uh, then when I served as a deputy secretary. When, let me ask this served. question. Then when you came to Congress and said there was no crisis at the southern border in your first few uh, trips here, or no crisis, there's no crisis, secure the border, secure... Nothing changed between then and now you're saying it's a crisis? Mr. Chairman, I have never minimized the challenge that the southern border presents. I didn't minimize it when I served as a federal prosecutor for 12 years from 1989 through 2001. I'm going to gavel myself since I have five seconds left, and uh, I now recognize the ranking member for his uh, five minutes of questioning. Thank you very much. Uh, again, welcome, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, Republicans have wasted... Uh, little time playing political games with our southern border while rejecting any serious solution and voting against border security funding. If you are for it, you should support resources. If you are against it, uh, I assume you vote against it because you're not for it. So um, I don't know why it happens, but Democrats historically uh, have supported robust funding for DHS. Uh, is DHS a perfect agency? Of course not. None of our agents. We strive for perfection, but we we'll understand resources are absolutely important. Republicans have tried to starve DHS personnel of the resources to needed to do their job. The chairman said, not another dime for DHS. When it comes time to fund the department, I guess addressing the surge in migration and stopping fentanyl and human trafficking isn't worth 10 cents to the Republicans charged with overseeing DHS. Republicans have ignored or voted against every opportunity to provide necessary resources to DHS. They voted no on the 2023 omnibus they re refused to consider the president's supplemental request, and they called the bipartisan Senate border bill dead on arrival within minutes of the text being released. Disturbingly, just a few weeks ago, two-thirds of the Republicans on this committee voted against funding DHS and border security. Republicans have taken their marching orders from Donald Trump and he wants chaos at the border to help his chances in this election. They want a show, not solutions. Democrats are united in finding solutions and providing the agents and officers of DHS with the resources needed to do so safely and effectively. Mr. Secretary, can you describe how the additional resources in the President's Emergency Supplemental or the bipartisan Senate border bill would help the department address the issues at the southern border. Ranking member Thompson, the president's supplemental would provide us with vital resources needed to hire additional personnel across the spectrum of our workforce that enforce, um, that enforce of the southern border and do so much more. The bipartisan Senate legislation 
would not only resource our department um, as we are needed to address a broken immigration system, but also, and very importantly, actually change the law and authorize us to use tools that have long been needed to address that broken immigration system. It would take a multi-year asylum process and reduce it to as little as 90 days or even less. That is a game changer in terms of deterring illegal migration to our border. Thank you. Uh, let's go to election security. We have elections coming up um, this November. Uh, and as you know, DHS is responsible for securing critical infrastructure, including our elections. Following Russian attempts to interfere with the 2016 elections, officials from across the Trump administration worked to counter efforts to undermine confidence in election outcomes. Unfortunately, after inciting a riot at the Capitol because he wasn't reelected, Donald Trump spent four years making legitimate election security work so politically toxic that I'm worried that the federal government is reluctant to support election officials and other stakeholders the way it should hit it this November. Last week's baseless claim about voter fraud by the former president and speaker will only make the work of the election officials harder. Mr. Secretary, Secretaries of State, local election officials, and other stakeholders relied on DHS's support to administer secure elections in 2020. Can you assure us that DHS will bring the full range of its resources to support the 2024 elections? Yes, I can, Ranking Member Thompson. Yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the chairman of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, uh, and former chairman of this committee, Mr. McCall, for his five minutes questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and good morning. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, you took an oath to protect the country from enemies, both foreign and domestic. I believe in many respects you violated that oath. Let me start with the Immigration Nationality Act. It states that, quote, the government shall take into custody any alien that has committed an aggravated felony. Those are dangerous, violent criminals, end of quote. And as you know, you're an attorney as am I, shall is mandatory language. It doesn't say maybe, it doesn't say, well, whatever you think at the time, it says shall. That, those are words by the Congress. Mandatory language means you shall detain. Yet in September 2021, your memo to your Border Patrol agents titled Guidance for Enforcement of Civil Immigration Law, you instructed your Border Patrol officers not to take prior criminal conduct into account when taking enforcement action. Whether you say whether a non-citizen poses a current threat to public safety is not to be determined according to bright lines or categories. Our personnel should not rely on the fact of a conviction or the result of a database search alone. In other words, you directed your own agents on the ground on the border to defy the laws of Congress, to release violent criminals into our countries. And you know what aggravated felon means under the statute, but for those who don't, it means it includes murderers, rapists, pedophiles, and drug traffickers. And God knows how many have been released into this country due to this policy that you issued in September 2021. My state took this up on a, to appeal to the Supreme Court where Justice Kavanaugh asked whether impeachment would be warranted for an official who defied the laws passed by Congress. President Biden's own Solicitor General replied, that such steps would be warranted, quote, in the face of a dramatic abdication of a statutory responsibility by the executive. In my view, you've defied the law, you defy congressional intent, in the best interest of the American people, and you've made this country, sir, 
far more dangerous place, not to mention the hundreds of those in the terror watch list who have gotten into this country. Um, how do you respond? Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I have three points to make. One, you mischaracterize the enforcement guidelines that I published. I read directly from them, sir. Sec secondly, uh, we have uh, removed more aggravated felons each month than the prior administration did. Third, my enforcement guidelines mirror to a great extent, and in the quoted language, um, uh, prior enforcement guidelines that other administrations have issued. The fact of the matter is that we enforce the law. We deem public security. All right, I'm going to reclaim my time on that. You're saying you enforce the law when you told your agents, don't take into account prior criminal conduct. Aggravated felons do not take into account the fact they maybe have a murder conviction or a rapist conviction. Or, well, that's what's under the statute, sir. And you told them, don't, don't, don't take that into account. And you can, you can say you've had the best record ever as a Secretary of Homeland. Uh, you can say that, but no, nobody believes it. And, and I got to tell you, back home in my state of Texas, very, very upset. I want to close with 1833 Supreme Court Justice Story said, where a, quote, where Lord Admiral has neglected to safeguard the seas, that shall be deemed an impeachable offense. I believe that's exactly the case here. You have neglected not just the seas, but the air, land, and the seas, and you've destroyed the fabric of this nation. And my last question to you is, how many persons on the terror watch list have gotten into this country? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd be pleased to provide you with data subsequent to this hearing. And will you provide the names and backgrounds? Let, let me assure you um, that the security of the American people is our highest priority. Will you provide the names and the backgrounds of the, of the I would persons? Be pleased to provide you with whatever information you need in the appropriate setting. I, that, a bit of a non-answer, but I'll, I'll take that. Thank you. Gentleman Yields, I now recognize Mr. Correa, the gentleman from California and the ranking member of the subcommittee on uh, border security and enforcement for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, welcome today. My first question is, you did take an oath to protect our country. Have you upheld that oath? I have, Congressman. That's, I believe, the fifth time I've taken the oath of office in my public service career. Thank you. Um, I'm the ranking member of the Subcommittee for Border Security and Enforcement. I've made it my mission to understand, learn the needs of your personnel at the border, both of our borders, all of our borders. Been at our southern border numerous times, spoken with your men and women in green and blue uniforms. It's clear that today we are facing challenges at home and abroad like we've never faced before. We just returned, my colleagues and I, from a trip to Africa. Common issue across many countries we visited was refugees. Egypt today, according to the president, is hosting 10 million refugees. Just one country alone. Here, we're talking about our budget. Budget for the personnel you need. A budget for the resources you need. Department of Homeland Security to protect our great country. Yet I've watched my colleagues on the other side of the aisle block the president's emergency supplemental request and to even refuse to consider the Senate's bipartisan border bill. And in the last few months, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have repeatedly threatened to shut down government over the Homeland Security budget. Secretary Mayorkas, can you please explain to us in plain terms what my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, their refusal to pass emergency supplemental requests, how does that put our country's national security in danger? Congressman, um, with the additional resources we would uh, be provided in the President's supplemental budget request, we, we would be able to advance significantly the security of the border. We would have additional equipment, additional technology, additional personnel in every facet of border security. 
You talk about additional personnel. Do we have a shortage of personnel right now at our borders? We do, Congressman. We need additional Office of Field Operations personnel uh, to man our ports of entry. We need additional uh, border patrol agents. Let me talk about that. Our ports of entry, that's where most of the fentanyl coming through this country enters through our ports of entry. San Isidro itself accounts for about 70% of all fentanyl coming into our country. Yet you're telling me we're short of personnel in these critical junctures? Is that what you're telling me, sir? We are. We, um, we need additional uh, field personnel uh, to um, equip those ports of entry with the staff that we need to enforce our laws. Mr. Secretary, let me go back and re-ask a question that you did not finish answering that was asked by my colleagues, which is the thousands of empty beds. How do you explain that? Um, uh, Congressman, you know, recently we've been over capacity um, in our ICE detention facilities. There are court cases that impose restrictions on our ability to use the beds that we have been funded. So if the laws were to change, maybe some of those court cases would not apply? Would that be the case? I would want to get back to you on that, Congressman. I will um, share with you that the president, I'm sorry, forgive me, the bipartisan Senate legislation would have funded the Department of Homeland Security with 50,000 detention beds, far more than we are resourced this year, and even more so than we were resourced last year. So how would that affect the situation that my colleagues on either side of the aisle are talking about? All these individuals that could be essentially held at these empty beds, so to speak, As adding to these empty beds, the talk about all these people being released, would they be held at these beds? As the, um, um, as everyone recognizes, the more detention beds that we uh, are funded for, the more individuals uh, that we would be able to detain, and the Supreme Court has quite clearly recognized the fact that the detention bed capacity for which we have been funded is inadequate to comply to the letter of the law. Beyond, beyond that, the bigger picture here is processing individuals at our borders that may or may not be eligible for asylum. We're critically short in those resources there. I do hope as we move forward we can address that issue. I'm out of time. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. Gentleman Yields, I now recognize the gentleman, Mr. Higgins from Louisiana, the chair of the subcommittee on border security and enforcement for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Over the past year, I found that many members of Congress failed to grasp the founders' true meaning regarding the constitutional writ of impeachment proceedings. Impeachment is not a criminal proceeding. It may include violations of written law, but it was never intended to be bound by specific criminal violations of statute. In many ways, impeachment proceedings are intended to be guided by principles of conduct that are far more deeply etched upon human history than any written law could ever be. The embezzlement of money by an employee is a criminal act and is a betrayal of trust, but betrayal of trust is not a statute. The House Committee on Homeland Security advanced articles of impeachment against Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. He has been impeached by the People's House. These articles did not impugn the Secretary's character nor list dissenting views on how to handle the crisis at our border. Instead, the impeachment articles against Secretary Mayorkas carry the charge of high crimes and misdemeanors. It's important that all Americans recognize the true meaning of high crimes and misdemeanors. While some of my colleagues have claimed that this charge is confined to specific violations of criminal statute, let us not fail to recognize the Founders' original intent and well-documented debate regarding the origin and meaning of this term. Article 2, Section 4, of our Constitution reads, the President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. 
Our founding fathers used this phrase, high crimes and misdemeanors, having 400 years of British Parliament historical precedent, which did not limit itself to direct criminal misconduct, but more importantly, encompassed a neglect of duty and abuse of power. This is not funny, Mr. Secretary. Literally misdemeaning the office and high authority that had been entrusted enshrining this phrase, this phrase in the Constitution. The Founding Fathers put explicit trust in Congress to determine what constitutes an impeachable offense and what is encompassed in high crimes and misdemeanors. Impeachment was never intended to be a criminal proceeding, but instead a review by the American people of a rogue executive and a mechanism for accountability when all else has failed. Secretary Mayorkas has not only betrayed the trust of the American people, his service as secretary has left a scar on our nation's soul that may never be removed. The articles of impeachment brought against Secretary Mayorkas passed the House and have, have now been delivered this afternoon to the Senate. It is vital that the Senate upholds its constitutional obligation to hold a fair impeachment trial. The American people deserve accountability for the gross misconduct of the Secretary's handling of our borders. It is incumbent upon members of Congress to enforce the authority outlined by the Founding Fathers for impeachment. Under Secretary Mayorkas, America has suffered. Over 300,000 Americans have died from cartel drug poisoning. Our communities are crushed under the weight of 12 million illegal aliens in the span of three years, and crime has reached unprecedented levels within American communities across the country. Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas' arrogant disregard for the security and sanctity of the American people has brought Congress to this point. He has brought unspeakable pain upon the nation. His service as secretary will forever be shrouded in shameful failure and generational trauma. Alejandro Mayorkas has been impeached by the House. He must now be tried by the Senate and removed from office. Mr. Chairman, I yield. The gentleman yields. I now recognize <clears throat> Mr. Carter, the gentleman from Louisiana, and the ranking member on the Subcommittee of Counterterrorism, Law Enforcement, and Intelligence for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Thompson. Thank you, Secretary Mayorkas, for joining us today as we review our fiscal year our FY25 budget request. President Biden's fiscal year 2025 budget request for DHS reflects Democrats' commitment to put politics aside and work in good faith to address security challenges facing our nation. Today's review is important so we can continue to find solutions, not politics, solutions. Solutions that we, as Americans, should want. We often have different approaches, but what we see here in the impeachment uh, is nothing more than a witch hunt and an opportunity to cloud the issue as evidenced by the fact that the Senate has a measure that would bring us to a measure of success to move the ball forward. But my colleagues in the House, because of a directive by the former president, quote unquote, to not give President Biden a victory. Our jobs are not to give presidents victories. Our jobs are to give the American people victories. Our jobs are to fight to make sure that we have a secure border. Our jobs are here to make sure that we see things through a lens, not as Republicans or Democrats, but as Americans and to, and to do what's right. Unfortunately, that has not and is not happening. I will go on record as predicting that the United States Senate will not even take up these articles of impeachment. Why? because they're meritless, because they're baseless, and because they're purely political in nature and are not rooted in the fairness, justice, or the American way. Um, so I'm gonna pivot a little bit, if, if, if we might, because we've talked about this 
quite a bit. So I'm going to pivot to flood insurance. Uh, Mr. Secretary, last time you were here before this committee, I relayed my concerns about FEMA's risk rating 2.0 and that it will leave many in my district, especially in low and moderate income communities, priced out of their homes by premium increases. You stated that you are reviewing and need to continue to review risk rating 2.0 given the concerns that have been expressed. Since then, I've only seen flood insurance prices get worse. Given the urgency of the situation and the impact on vulnerable communities, can you provide the committee with an update on how the department is taking steps to help communities, struggle, communities that are struggling with FEMA's risk rating 2.0? Uh, Congressman, um, I will uh, follow up uh, with you and provide you um, an update on um, flood insurance 2.0. I can assure you that we are taking extraordinary measures through FEMA to reach otherwise disenfranchised populations. We have issued guidance and changed our policies to make sure uh, that um, minority and underserved communities have greater access uh, to our grant programs, to individual assistance, and to other uh, resources that FEMA provides uh, in the wake of natural disasters and to uh, strengthen and protect communities. I will provide you with an update with respect to flood insurance 2.0 specifically. And one of the things that we have repeatedly asked for both in this committee, as well as in transportation infrastructure for which I also serve, and in individual meetings in my office and in, in the office of the FEMA administrator is the formula. What algorithm, what formula is, is used to derive uh, these rates? We are consistently said that it's some uh, algorithm, but we have yet to be shared um, what that is. What does it look like? How do we explain to the people in our districts how these rates are developed when uh, we get a vague uh, answer to that? Uh, Mr. Secretary, I would greatly appreciate if you can drill down and, and share with the American people um, what this formula is, how it's derived, and more importantly, how we can adjust it to make sure that people are not being forced to make a decision about being able to live in the home that they've now paid for and they can no longer afford to insure because the rates are higher than the note was when they had a mortgage. This is untenable. Uh, and I'd ask that you would, you would look into that and share some meaningful uh, answers, sir. And uh, I will do so, Congressman. Thank you. My time is up. The gentleman yields. I now recognize uh, Mr. Guest, the gentleman from Mississippi and the vice chair of the Committee on Homeland Security for his five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to point out what I highlighted uh, last week when you testified. You came in in your opening statement and you talk about your budget being insufficient. And you seek to place the blame on Congress that we're not giving you the resources and your department the resources that you need. But last year in the FY24 budget, which we just passed, Congress appropriated you $61.8 billion in discretionary spending, which was more than you asked for. And so Congress is giving you more money than you're asking for, but you're repeatedly coming into these hearings and you're trying to say that you don't have the financial resources that you need to carry out the job. Chairman Green mentioned the detention beds. The detention beds, which you and I talked about last week, are incredibly troubling and the fact that you come in and you once again, you ask for less detention beds, significantly less detention beds than we funded in the FY24 budget. You told me in that hearing last week that you agreed with the Senate 50,000 detention beds, but yet you come in and you ask Congress only to fund 34,000 when we currently are funding 41,500. 41, and you continue to seek to place the blame on us. I'm reading from the physical report 2023, ICE's annual report. In that annual report, Mr. Secretary, a report which is issued by your agency, on page 17 it says, congressional funding for ERO detention beds have remained relatively static for several years and the detained population is limited as a result. And answering a question from Mr. Correa, you talk about the fact that the court says that there's been inadequate funding for detention beds. 
And so how do you come in here and you ask for less detention beds, but yet every time you testify, you try to place the blame back on Congress? Because we are actually funding more detention beds every year than you're asking for. And in a time in which we see a record surge of immigrants coming across the border, in a time in which you have at least now finally admitted that there is a crisis on the border, where we're seeing reports every day in the media about violent crimes committed by immigrants who are not in custody, who are not detained, but released into the interior. And yet you come in here, and as a key part of your budget, you're asking for substantially less detention beds. And I find that especially troubling, Mr. Secretary, as I look at this, continue to look at the report uh, that was provided by ICE, in which I see, according to the FY23 year end report, that the non-detained docket, the, the, do the docket that shows the number of non-detained individuals who you've allowed in the country, has now reached over 6.2 million people. 6.2 million. I spoke just yesterday with the ICE director, Director Lightliner, and in my conversation with him, I brought up the fact of what was in this report. And he told me, Mr. Secretary, that that number is now over 7 million, that that report is old, that that number is more than 7 million. Axios reported just several weeks ago that by the end of this fiscal year, FY24, October 1st, that that number is expected to grow to 8 million. And so we see this record number of immigration, the record number of people that you, as the secretary, are allowing to come into the country, but yet we're seeing you do nothing to ask for more detention beds. And I, and I find that troubling. And I have to believe that I'm not the only member of this committee that finds it troubling that we're not asking for a sufficient number of detention beds. And Mr. Secretary, I also had the opportunity to ask you last week when you testified before the Appropriations Committee about this news article, a news article reported by Fox News. I provided you some of the content when we met last week, but I wanted to show this to you. And this is from an article dated January the 8th, 2024. It says, Mayorkas tells Border Patrol agents that above 85% of illegal immigrants have been released into the United States. It goes on there in the first paragraph. It says, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas on Monday admitted to Border Patrol agents that the current rate of release for illegal immigrants apprehended at the southwest border is above 85%. He said Mayorkas made the statements when meeting privately with agents and that there were sources in the room who heard that. It goes on to say that there were at least three agents who verified to Fox News that you made that statement. And so, Mr. Secretary, did you make the statement that uh, it was reported on January the 8th, 2024? Uh, Congressman, uh, as I mentioned to you last week, I do not recall uh, that exchange uh, in an internal meeting with the workforce. And let me assure you that the security of the southern border is our highest priority. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Thanadar, the general from Michigan, the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Transportation and Maritime Security, for his five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Secretary, um, clearly you have a tough job. You're faced with a worldwide migration challenge, a deeply broken immigration system, and limited resources to address the challenges. And unfortunately, my Republican colleagues don't seem to want to help to fix that problem. I admire your efforts to expand parole programs for migrants in countries facing extreme conditions like Haiti and Cuba, as well as to restore family reunification programs for families facing widespread violence in Central America. America is a nation of immigrants, as you know, and yet we have a broken immigration system. In 1979, growing up in poverty, I was fortunate to have gotten admission into a PhD program in the United States to study. And that would have changed my life. And I went to the 
American embassy in Mumbai. Got there at 5 a.m. in the morning, stood in line, only to be denied my student visa. And the embassy continued to deny it for four more times. And the fifth time, the visa got approved only because the denying officer was on vacation to the United States. You know, our H-1B visas is an issue. Our immigration uh, country quotas is creating such a stressful environment for families. Uh, companies, uh, technology companies are unable to find uh, skilled workforce. Uh, countries like Canada and Australia are taking away uh, some of our skilled workforce because of our broken immigration system. I want to see an orderly immigration process that benefits the United States, that benefits our economy, and helps create American jobs. How do you think Congress can help you to achieve that? Congressman, um, the President, on his very first day in office, uh, presented uh, Congress with a comprehensive legislative package to fix what everyone agrees is our broken immigration system. To advance that piece of legislation and to advance the Senate's bipartisan legislation would transform our broken immigration system and reform it. It hasn't been reformed since 1996. It is long outdated and long broken. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And I want to give you an opportunity to respond uh, to uh, Congresswoman Guess, uh, uh, Congressman Guess, uh, uh, questions. I think you may not have adequate time to respond if you so choose to do. Um, Congressman, uh, we uh, support um, the uh, funding of 41,500 beds. We support the funding of 50,000 detention beds that the Senate's bipartisan legislation uh, provided. It is um, most regrettable uh, that that bipartisan legislation is not advanced. Uh, we urge Congress to advance it. It would advance our border security immeasurably. Uh, I, Mr. Chair, may I yield my time to the gentleman from New York? Thank you, Mr. Tenorar. We just have a, a few seconds, um, Mr. Secretary, but I wanted to follow up on what Chairman McCall was talking about because um, he is citing the INA shall detain language and a memo that you issued in September of 2021. And I want to give you an opportunity to explain what it says in that memo because even in the quote that he read, he said that aggravated felonies shall not be the only consideration when deciding whether or not to seek detention. So can you explain what your guidance was in the face of the reality that there, is insuff there are insufficient beds to comply with the letter of the law? Congressman, the direction to law enforcement agents was to use their discretion, their experience, to determine who presents the greatest public safety threat and to detain those individuals, period. Okay, the gentleman's time has expired. Someone else can yield, of course, if they'd like. I now recognize Mr. Bishop, the gentleman from North Carolina and the chair of the Subcommittee on Oversight for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Mayorkas, you've frequently testified about the actions and efforts of DHS over the course of the uh, time you've been secretary. Let me just ask you about the results of your more than three years in, of tenure. Do you consider the results of your administration of the Department of Homeland Security to be a success? I am incredibly proud of the work of the men and women of the Department of Homeland Security, Congressman. They you, risk their you lives. You consider it to be a success? I am, I am incredibly proud of everything they do. Yep. Do you consider it to be a success? I consider them to be a tremendous success in advancing the safety and security of the American people. With the Do you consider your administration of the Department of Homeland Security to be a success? With the resources and authorities they have, they've done an extraordinary job. Um, in November 2022, I asked you uh, whether you continue to maintain that the border is secure. You said yes and it's getting more secure every day. Do you still say so? Congressman, with the uh, resources and the authorities that we have been provided, it is as secure as we can make it. Under your orders, the uh, Department of Homeland Security paroled Venezuelan Jose Ibarra into the United States. 
He, of course, went on to a variety of crimes culminating in beating a young woman to death in Georgia. The relevant statute grants you authority to parole aliens into the United States, quote, only on a case-by-case basis for urgent humanitarian reasons or significant public benefit, close quote. Which was it in Mr. Ivara's case, humanitarian reasons or significant public benefit that you paroled him into the United States? Uh, Congressman, uh, we abide uh, by the law. We apply our parole processes uh, in obeyance of the law. Uh, The public safety of the American people is our highest priority, and I would be pleased to share case details with you on any case of concern to you subsequent to this hearing. I don't have the case details uh, with me today. Well, I'm not really asking for detail. I'm only asking for one simple uh, fact, which is, was it urgent humanitarian reasons or significant public benefit that, under your orders, Mr. Ibarra was paroled into the United States? I, um, the, my answer remains the same, Congressman. You mean you, 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 you would have to review something, you'd have to review something before you could provide case details, or you just can't say it in this forum? Uh, the former. Don't know. You don't know. As I, I said, I do not have the details with respect to that individual's case, um, and I would be pleased to provide them uh, to you, Congressman. Mr. Secretary, uh, news reports, uh, or, or the, the Heritage Foundation Oversight Project has released this document uh, that uh, is allegedly a flyer distributed uh, at an, a non-governmental organization in Mexico called the Resource Center Matamoros, uh, which apparently, which which is said to read in part, if translated, reminder to vote for President Biden when you are in the United States. We need another four years of his term to stay open. Um, I I, I note, by the way, I understand this uh, RCM has has denied that this is authentic, uh, but of course, there's so there are competing reports about it. But let me ask you this, what actions is the Department of Homeland Security taking to ensure that especially given the millions of illegal entries, including two million uh, gotaways, that non-citizens are being prevented from registering and voting unlawfully? Congressman, um, uh, individuals who are not citizens of the United States cannot vote in federal elections. Ah, but that's not what I asked. I asked what actions DHS is taking to ensure that that doesn't occur. Well, uh, two things. Number one, I believe that it is state and local election officials that monitor the eligibility of individuals. We do not um, oversee uh, the uh, election enrollment process. What we do is enforce our borders and, Mm. in fact... So uh, says Shorter, nothing. In fact... Uh, How can Congress and the American people have confidence that the outcome of close elections will not turn on the votes of non-citizens who have registered and voted unlawfully? Um, Congressman, election security is one of our uh, priorities. In the distribution of federal grant funds to state and local jurisdictions, we have made election security a priority, and we have mandated a minimum. I'll reclaim my time. Last point. I'm just curious. Following up, Mr. Guest, you asked for less detention beds, and you explained that you did that based on the level of detention beds that would be needed under the Senate, quote, quote, bipartisan bill. How is that bill bipartisan other than it's supported by James Lankford? Is there another Republican in the Senate or the House that supported that bill? Uh, Congressman, uh, we continue to support the bipartisan legislation uh, that a group of senators worked on for months. And My time's expired, Mr. The, Chairman. Thank the you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Mr. Magaziner, the gentleman from Rhode Island, and the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Counterterrorism and Law Enforcement and Intelligence for his five minutes questions. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Our country faces a range of security threats from foreign terrorist organizations, domestic extremists, cartels, organized crime, and natural disasters, just to name a few. And while you have been diligently doing your job, along with your colleagues at the Department, to protect the American people in the face of these challenges, our Republican colleagues in the House have instead been playing politics culminating with a political impeachment that had no legal basis. I am sorry that some of our colleagues have chosen to make you the target of political attacks instead of getting you the tools that you need to do your job to keep people safe. And I want you to know that many of us are still, working, are still willing to put politics aside and work with you 
and work with each other on a bipartisan basis to protect the homeland. The President's fiscal year 2025 budget requests $62 billion for the Department, including hundreds of millions more for staffing and technology to secure the southern border. It also proposes $4.7 billion for a Southwest Border Contingency Fund to provide resources to the Department when migration along the Southwest border warrants additional capacity. This is the right thing to do, and I hope that our Republican colleagues will support this funding unlike last year when they delayed action on the President's supplemental funding request for the border for months while they wasted time with impeachment. It is inexcusable that our Republican colleagues did not pass the final fiscal 24 funding for the Department for nearly six months, forcing the Department to work under multiple CRs, reducing operations and overstraining the workforce of the Department, and I hope that fiscal 25 will be different. Funding the Department of Homeland Security is also critical because our nation faces an increased threat from the rise of domestic violent extremists. Now, we heard from you, Mr. Secretary, and from FBI Director Ray last November during the Worldwide Threats Hearing that the top domestic terrorism threat we face continues to be from racially and ethnically motivated and anti-government motivated violent extremists. Some of these are organized groups like the group that engaged in the plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan, and some of the groups who stormed the Capitol on January 6th in a violent attempt to overturn a legal and lawful election. Others are lone actors, like the individual who attacked Paul Pelosi. And many of these individuals are shamefully inspired by and scapegoated by members of this Congress and by former President Trump. But the Government Accountability Office has shown that domestic terrorism-related cases has increased dramatically in recent years. So with this alarming fact in mind, I would like to turn to you, Mr. Secretary. Can you tell us what is the Department of Homeland Security seeing with respect to the threat from domestic violent extremists, particularly as we glow, grow closer to the election? And what steps are the Department taking to address any potential threats to government bodies, officials, and the public at large? Congressman, um, we are, as um, Director Ray and I have um, expressed previously, in a heightened threat environment. Uh, indeed, um, individuals drawn to violence uh, because of ideologies of hate, false narratives, uh, anti-government sentiments are a significant concern of ours. Uh, we do a number of things. We disseminate information and analysis to a state, local, tribal, territorial law enforcement and other officials. We distribute grant funds. We are grateful uh, for uh, Congress's support of those grant funds. We need those funds to increase, to uh, enable local communities um, to protect and guard themselves. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, we have a very important targeted violence and terrorism prevention grant program that enables communities to employ best practices in the identification of an individual who may be drawing to violence and intervene before a tragedy occurs. Those are some examples. Well, I thank you, Mr. Secretary, for that, and particularly the support of state and local law enforcement agencies. As we saw on January 6th, it is often law enforcement in uniform who are uh, you know, on the receiving end of these assaults and this violence, and we need to do everything we can to support them uh, against this threat. So I thank you very much, and uh, I'm out of time, so I'll yield back. The gentleman yields. I now recognize uh, Mr. Jimenez, the uh, gentleman from Florida and the Chair of Transportation and Maritime Security Subcommittee. Here's five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I find it amazing that our, Demo our Democrat colleagues from across the aisle are always throwing money at the, at the issue. Always it's money, 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 except that uh, the real culprit here has been over 64 uh, actions taken by the executive branch that actually caused the problem at the border. Uh, not once have I ever heard the, any of my Democrat colleagues ask for, why, did the, why don't we start constructing the wall again? Why don't we reinstitute Me Remain in Mexico policy, which actually will take care of about 70% of the problem that we've had. Uh, Mr. Mayorkas, uh, I believe that in fiscal year 21, we had a record number of encounters uh, at the border, uh, and I think uh, only surpassed by fiscal year 22 when we had another record encounter 
uh, at the border and then surpassed again in 2023 when we had another record for encounters at the border. Do you expect another record in 2024? Congressman, I strongly uh, encourage Congress to pass the Senate's bipartisan legislation, which would make a significant difference and advance our security interests at the southern border and the northern border. Have you ever uh, asked the president to reconsider some of his 64 actions uh, that have led to the crisis that we have uh, right now at the border? Uh, Congressman, we are uh, facing uh, the largest displacement of people around the world, including in our hemisphere. Have you ever asked the President of the United States to reconsider any of the 64 executive actions that he has taken uh, to address the crisis at the border? Uh, Congressman, um, I am uh, not familiar with the 64 to which you refer, and I assure you that they are not the cause of the largest displacement of people in the world, including in our hemisphere, and to include, of course, a number of people, a significant number of people fleeing the authoritarian regime in Cuba, which both you and I uh, have personally experienced. I think that authoritarian regime has been in place for about 60 years. Uh, and so uh, it, it doesn't make sense to me that somehow now, okay, they're all fleeing the authoritarian regime in Cuba. You and I both left that authoritarian regime a long time ago. So, um, Again, uh, are you familiar with uh, the, the president's executive order to stop the construction of the wall on the southern border? I most certainly am. Did you, have you advised him that maybe it's a good idea to start construction again on the southern wall and the wall on the southern border to stop the flow of illegal immigration? Congressman, uh, I do not believe uh, it is. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you. I mean, I only have certain times. So thank you. You said no. Have you ever talked to the president about reinstituting remain in Mexico policy, which many, many uh, uh, experts have said probably will take care of 70 percent of the problem? Have you ever talked to him about that? Congressman, the remain in Mexico uh, program was implemented in January of 2019, I believe. Um, I believe in 2019, the number of encounters at the southern border exceeded those in um, 2018 by almost 100 percent, if I have my data correct. Yeah, but the number of encounters in 2020 were far less than the number of encounters in 2021. Would you say that's correct? Congressman, if you'll recall what occurred in 2020, two points. Number one, the COVID-19 pandemic. Number two, remain in Mexico in order to implement it we rely upon the sovereign nation of Mexico's agreement. Mexico has unequivocally stated it will not support any implementation of Remain in Mexico, the success of which is quite dubious. Interesting point. The only reason they won't support a, a, a they did support the Remain in Mexico policy and then you unilaterally withdrew it. It wasn't because of Mexico asking you if you'd stop it. You just did it. All right. Uh, so I only have uh, about 56 seconds left. We're currently witnessing total chaos and disorder in Haiti. The U.S. has already begun to evacuate citizens and is collaborating with regional partners to address the violence. Is the United States patrolling or admitting Haitians into the state of Florida and elsewhere that have not received a viable background check? Congressman, we screen and vet um, uh, individuals before uh, paroling them into the United States. Thank you, and I yield my time back. Gentleman Yields, uh, I know in the past, Mr. Secretary, we've pressed on and never given you a chance for a break. I want to offer if, there, if you need uh, a break or we can, we can press on. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm prepared to press on. Okay. I may, re I may revisit that at some point with your indulgence. Uh, absolutely. Um, I just know last time we had you in here, I think you went four hours straight and never got a break, and I, I, I felt bad about that, so just I wanted to offer. Um, I now recognize uh, the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for her five minutes question. Go, I'm sorry. All right, we'll go with uh, Mr. Ivey uh, and f the gentleman from Maryland. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Fire, fire away for five minutes. Appreciate it. Um, Mr. Mayorkas, thank you for being here today and for the work that you do. I, you know, I've been listening to my colleagues on the other side talk about treading on the Constitution and a scar on our nation's soul. But it seems to me that uh, the impeachment proceeding that was moved forward out of this committee um, 
was the true scar on the Constitution and really did tread on the Constitution. It's uh, <clears throat> interesting to me, if we go back, uh, I want to say the fix was in, uh, almost before you got into the job, there was an article of impeachment filed in August of 2021. I'm not even sure you'd finished unpacking entirely yet, but uh, there was already a movement to remove you from office. Uh, then we had the chairman, as the ranking member mentioned earlier, um, speaking to a group of donors and talking about uh, this is going to be fun, that referencing the impeachment of you, and uh, get the popcorn. And that was almost a year ago. Uh, and then we came to the actual hearings that were held here. I think there were two. Uh, now, I had a little experience dealing with impeachment proceedings in the House previously back in the 80s when I worked on the Judiciary Committee staff. We didn't, re we didn't remove anybody from office with two hearings. In fact, we gave people due process. They had a chance to present evidence uh, and the like. Um, and it was taken in a much more serious manner than this was. And, and then I got to say, you know, we heard uh, another one of my colleagues sort of try to reconstitute what the standard is for impeachment. Um, you know, the language is pretty plain on its face. Uh, treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. And there's been an effort to try and recalibrate that because there's no evidence of you committing treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. So they lowered the bar. I, I want to read something briefly from one of your predecessors, um, uh, Mike Chertoff, who was uh, the Homeland Security Se uh, Secretary under uh, the Bush administration. He said, in referencing this, the effort to impeach you, uh, he wrote this back in January, I can say with confidence that for all the investigating the House Committee on Homeland Security has done, they have failed to put forth evidence that meets the bar. That is why Republicans aren't seeking to hold Mr. Mayorkas in the, to the Constitution's high crimes and misdemeanor standard for impeachment. They make the unsupported argument that he is derelict in his duty. And then with respect to um, that issue, the issue of trying to get something done, instead of continuing on with the, the, the theatrics of impeachment, uh, former Secretary Chertoff says, um, I don't agree with every policy decision the Biden administration has made. There are aspects of immigration strategy that are worthy of debate. But House Republicans are ducking difficult policy work and hard-fought compromise. Impeachment is a diversion from fixing our broken immigration laws and giving DHS the resources needed to secure the border. Here today, we've discussed the bipartisan Senate bill uh, that while we were moving forward with the effort to try and put together an impeachment proceeding against you, at least my Republican colleagues, you were working in the Senate with oh, Senator Lankford and others to try and put together an actual bipartisan bill to address the problems at the border. And uh, that came forward. It was killed uh, by House Republicans when former President Trump gave the word that he didn't want it to move forward. And we haven't had any work done on trying to find an, a, a bipartisan effort to address these concerns since that day. Uh, so we've got a lot of statements being made in here today about uh, the problems at the border uh, and the budgets and issues along those lines. And you've already addressed some of the budgetary issues. But I, I do want to say this. Um, you know, I think it's critical for the Senate. They're going to, after we're done with this, the, the, these theatrics will be over and they'll march the articles of impeachment over to the Senate um, and ask the Senate to remove you from office after a trial. But I think the Senate's already made it clear that that's not going to happen, and it shouldn't. In fact, there shouldn't even be a trial over there because this is such uh, an adulterated process here. Uh, and it's such a scar on the history of the Constitution. It's the first time in 150 plus years where there's been an effort to remove a cabinet member that's gone this far. And for good reason, um, the Senate should throw it out and make a statement that this is not the kind of impeachment proceedings that we expect from the House of Representatives. It certainly isn't what I expected when I got here. I saw different when I worked here in the 80s. I saw how it was supposed to be done. This is not how it was supposed to be done. And I, I did want to conclude on this note, just um, a couple of members on the House Republican Caucus. I don't want to paint with too broad a bush, but Ken Buck of Colorado, this isn't just an impeachment. Gentlemen's time has expired. Sorry, Mr. Ivey. I know the chairman has wanted to keep us on a tight schedule. Thank you, Mr. Guest. I appreciate it. And thank you, Mr. Mayorkas. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from the great state of Texas, August Fluger, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary, is the border secure? 
Congressman, as I have uh, articulated uh, earlier in this hearing. Just a uh, yes or no is fine. Is, is the border secure, Mr. Secretary, with today? The, with the authorities and the funding that we have, it is as secure as it can be. Wow. Uh, we all know that this is not a budget issue. That it's a policy issue. Um, is, a, is a terrorist attack inside the United States of America imminent? Let me assure you, Congressman, that the safety and security of the American people is our highest priority. Is it imminent? Um, the same answer, Congressman. Is, is a terror attack on the homeland of the United States of America imminent today? Let me assure you that we remain vigilant every Do you brief day. the President? Have you briefed the President that a terror attack on the United States of America is imminent? Congressman, let me assure you that the safety and security of the American people... Mr. Secretary, are you the principal advisor on matters of homeland security to the President of the United States? I am one of them, Congressman. Have you briefed the President that there are known or suspected terrorists still at large inside the United States? Congressman, let me assure you, as I have previously, that the safety and security of the American people... Mr. Secretary, I'm gonna, I'm, I'd like to remind you that you're under oath. Have you briefed the President of the United States that there are people who match the terror watch list that are still at large inside our country? Congressman, I repeat my answer. Is that a no? Uh, have you not briefed the President? Congressman, I have briefed the President. Mr. Secretary, let me ask you a question about uh, your previous um, Test, uh, testifying in November, and I asked you then, I said, um, is every single person who matched the terror watch list, have they been apprehended? And you did not give me an answer. I'll ask you again. Those that have matched the terror watch list, that have attempted to or have entered this country illegally, are they detained, 100% of them? Congressman, let me assure you once again, that individuals that pose a threat to our national security or the safety of the American people are the highest priority for detention, and we execute... Are they all detained? And we execute... Mr. Secretary, that. are they all detained? Congressman? Because Christopher Ray sat right next to you. He had the courage to answer this question, and he said no. So do you agree with Christopher Ray in his testimony in November of 2023 that not every single person who matched the terror watch list has been detained? Do you agree with that, that, testi that his testimony? If you, um, if you are referring to the terrorist screening data set, the TSDS, uh, we make public safety and national security determinations. Mr. Secretary, I think it's very important that you answer this question. The American public deserves to know the answer. Are there people who have matched the terror screening database, the terror watch list, any acronym that you choose to use still at large and not apprehended and not detained in this country as of today? Congressman, if we determine that an individual on the terrorist screening data set is a threat to national security or public safety, they are a priority for detention. And I understand they're a priority, but that doesn't mean they're detained. So are you going to testify honestly under oath today? I'd like to remind you you're under oath while you're testifying today. Are there people still at large that match the terror watch list? Congressman, if an individual is on the terrorist screening data set and they pose a threat to national security or public safety, they are a priority for detention. Is our country at risk of a terror attack? Congressman, we are in a heightened threat environment as Director Is that a yes? We are in a heightened threat environment as Director Ray and I have both testified. And it is therefore why the personnel of the Department of Homeland Security... Have you briefed security, the President of the United States on that heightened threat? Congressman, I have briefed the President, as have others, on the threat landscape that the United States is facing and that is driving the vigilance of 268,000 men and women in the Department of Homeland Security. Um, Mr. Secretary, you said earlier to my colleague, Mr. Bishop, you'd be willing to share the details on any case. However, you have not. We've been repeatedly asking for those details, specifically asking for details on the terror watch list, and yet your department has not done that. Will you brief us in the next seven days on the actual metrics and details uh, for uh, the, the terror screening database and who those people are? Will you brief us in an unclassified setting who those people are in seven days? 
uh, Congressman, I will be pleased to follow up with you in the appropriate setting. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Goldman from the state of New York for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Mayorkas, thank you uh, for being here once again to endure the completely uncalled for, unwarranted personal attacks uh, from my Republican colleagues. Uh, I want to get into some of what they have been saying um, because it's truly shocking that we are where we are. Uh, on the one hand, my colleague from Florida says that all Democrats want to do is throw money at the problem. Mr. Pfluger just said, this is a policy issue, it's not a money issue. Okay. Is the Senate bipartisan bill that you worked on, along with the second most conservative Republican center in the Senate, an independent and a Democrat that was endorsed by Senate Republican leadership, a policy bill or an appropriations bill? Uh, it is both, um, Congressman, it is both an appropriation bill and an immigration reform bill in fixing what everyone agrees is a broken system. It would provide us with new legal authorities that are much needed and would really advance the security of the border. And one of those critical uh, revisions is in the asylum process. Um, I know this is not under your purview, but do you have a, any sense of how many asylum applicants ultimately are granted asylum in this country? Congressman, um, it of course depends on the demographics, um, uh, but as a general uh, rule, I believe it is approximately 20, 25 percent ultimately receive asylum, but I would want to verify uh, that uh, statistic, and I probably shouldn't share it given my and it takes Understood, and, it, and it, uh, there are different numbers, but it takes at least five years and perhaps as many as 10 years for a case to be completely adjudicated. Is that right? It takes many years uh, until a case is finally adjudicated. So let's just say, hypothetically, that we had an asylum processing system that could process... Uh, any applications within 90 days, six months. I, am I correct that that means that 75 to 80 percent of the people who apply, who apply for asylum would not get asylum and would be returned to their own country? Um, th that would enable us to remove people far more quickly. You are correct. And that would make a, a sea change of a difference in our ability to enforce uh, the southern border of the United States. And is it your view that uh, if that were the case, that there would not be an incentive for anyone who knows that he or she may not qualify for asylum to come to this country knowing that that person would be able to make an application to get a work authorization and stay here for at least five years to work? Is that correct? That is, Congressman. And that, of course, creates a tremendous incentive for people to come across the border. The problem is not our credible fear standard. The problem is not the policy of asylum. The problem is that we don't have the resources to process asylum applications as expeditiously as is necessary. So no one over here is talking about throwing money at the problem. We're talking about solving the problem. And in the Senate, they tried to solve the problem. They tried not just with appropriations, but with a policy bill. Unfortunately, the Republicans have put politics over our border security. They want chaos in order to win an election rather than to solve the problems. You don't have to take my word for it. Let's quote Donald Trump who said that he sabotaged the bipartisan deal to secure the border because, quote, it made it much better for the opposing side, unquote, and that he had stated that he, quote, killed, unquote, the deal. Senator Lankford himself said that a top Republican told me that if I try to move a bill that solves the border crisis during this election year, he will do whatever he can to destroy me. He said, I do not want you to solve this during the presidential election. 
There was a policy bill. There was a policy change that would have significantly addressed the problems at the border. And instead, you all on the other side of the aisle sabotaged it where you baselessly impeached the secretary who's trying to solve our problems at the southern border because you want to win it. You want to win in November. The gentleman's time you has expired. You don't want to solve the problem. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Mr. Garbarino, the gentleman from New York, for uh, the chairman of the Subcommittee on Cybersecurity for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll remind my colleague that the only bill that's actually passed one of the houses that addressed the border crisis was the one we passed here, H.R. 2. Nothing actually passed the Senate. So, I mean, we have acted. The Senate has not. If they, you know, if they want to send us a bill, let them. They haven't been able to. Uh, Secretary. I want to ask a question about the uh, nonprofit security grant program. Uh, Anti-Semitism is on the rise here, and this has been exacerbated by the horrendous uh, acts of the terror in Israel on October 7th and the war that has followed. Uh, this program protects a lot of uh, Americans. It has been essential for securing places of worship and providing safe places for Jewish Americans uh, to practice their religion, as is their constitutional right. The current request is for Fiscal year 2025, 385 million. Seeing what we've seen and knowing what you know, uh, the risk on the ground, especially to uh, these Jew Jewish Americans, is 385 million dollars enough? Uh, Congressman, uh, you know, we make um, uh, trade-offs um, uh, under the Fiscal Responsibility Act, but we certainly believe that the nonprofit security grant program is in dire need of additional funding for precisely the reason you express. We are indeed in a heightened threat environment. Anti-Semitism and violence born of it continues to be on the rise, as do other uh, violent acts born of hate. So we think three, uh, 385 is enough to, to, to protect the Americans at these facilities? We believe it is a significant advance uh, in the protection of our communities across the country. Thank you. I want to move now to uh, cyber workforce. Um, GAO came out with a report uh, which was kind of startling. Uh, CISA has, for the entire defense, an action uh, on OT, operational technology, for all of our critical infrastructure that CISA oversees. They have a response team, I think, of 11 people, four em five employees and, and, or four employees and seven contractors. That is grossly under, uh, that is definitely below, below the need of, of what we actually need. What is the current cyber workforce gap at the Department of Homeland Security right now? Um, Congressman, um, I'll have to get back to you on the specific number, but let me um, express my deep gratitude on, on the part of CISA and our department for your uh, support of our cybersecurity mission and all that we are seeking to do. I, I appreciate that, and I do think CISA does a, a great job, but when you see that what they only have 11 employees that cover OT. You know, they have a great uh, use of the cyber talent, talent, cyber talent management system, but we are repeatedly seeing cyber attack after cyber attack after cyber attack. And Americans are starting to ask me, what, what are we doing? And there is a workforce problem. There is a workforce shortage. 11 employees for just to oversee OT, that is not good. That is not good enough. I understand the request this year for CISA is just all over $3 billion to fully fund the entire uh, agency. There needs to be more focus, and I've spoken directly recently about this, but you oversee, the, you oversee the agency. There needs to be more of a focus on cybersecurity. Um, in that, and I also have to say, I see that CISA just, uh, just released its notice of proposed rulemaking for the CIRCIA uh, rule. The budget requests 115, almost 116 million for its implementation, including staffing and technology. I have been a supporter of this CERCIA rule. I think it is, it could do great things uh, uh, for our defense, cyber defense. But now when you have competing rules like the SEC legislation, which you yourself has said is duplicative, I don't know if there's a need for CC anymore because nobody is stopping the SEC from doing what they're doing and it's causing a huge problem. CISA should oversee this. It's under the Department of Homeland Security. I think I would like to see more from the agency yourself included by pushing back on these duplicative rules, the SEC rule and others that are proposed 
Uh, they, yes, the current cyber reporting bill that the SEC put out uh, is just one of, I think, five that, they, that the uh, Chairman Gensler has proposed. There's actually a report out there that the bad actors are using the SEC rule as a way to, uh, as a way to uh, hack more people. This is something that the administration is doing under the SEC. You have said that before, this rule is duplicative. I think you need to, we've been saying it's bad. I think you need to go back and tell the president that this rule has to stop. My time has expired. The gentleman's time has uh, expired, and I understand, Mr. Menez, you want to uh, go next. And Mr. Garcia, you're going to hold. Okay. So I now recognize uh, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Menendez, for five minutes of question. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you, as always, for being here. We appreciate your willingness to engage with us both in this uh, setting and in individual offices and conversations. I just feel it's important to address some of the things that have been said here by our Republican colleagues because... Uh, they should not uh, stand uncorrected. Uh, first, it's been said by Chairman McCall that you violated your oath. I wholeheartedly disagree with that. Chairman McCall said, you have made this country much more, much more dangerous. I disagree with that. Uh, you and everyone at DHS works every single day to keep this country and all of us protected. So thank you and to all the dedicated public servants who serve alongside of you for your work. Chairman McCall had also said that you destroyed the fabric of this country. I wholeheartedly disagree with that. And thank you again for your service to this country. Um, Mr. Bishop said, and questioned the success of your administration, I want to refer back to what former Homeland Secretary, uh, Security Secretary Chertoff said about the sham impeachment hearings that we've had here, that House Republicans are ducking difficult policy work and hard-fought compromise. Impeachment is a diversion from fixing our broken immigration laws and giving DHS the resources needed to secure the border. That's the conversation that we should be having today. So if we're going to judge success, I would commend the work that you and your colleagues have done, but I would question the success of this committee and our oversight jurisdiction and our failure to live up to our mandate. I have two quick questions. Um, we had discussed the Remain in Mexico policy. You had said that that requires a cooperation of Mexico. We've also heard about building a wall. Uh, former President Trump said that Mexico would pay for that wall. Um, has Mexico agreed to pay for the building of a wall? Uh, no, it is not, Congressman. Thank you for clarifying that point. Um, and before I move on to the substantive questions that you came here to discuss, um, as you've had to, I imagine, spend an immense amount of time and resources as the agency has had to preparing for that impeachment uh, proceeding that came through this committee, and I'm proud to see you still standing. Uh, and you will continue to keep standing. And just a reminder that Republicans have been more successful at removing their own members from positions like former Speaker McCarthy, and now the process that seems to be underway for removing Speaker Johnson. So you keep hanging in there while they keep removing their own members from uh, positions of leadership. Um, I want to go into fentanyl, which is an issue that's of grave concern to many of us. Uh, I want to talk about your work combating fentanyl in our country. The Department of Homeland Security is on the front lines executing President Biden's plan. And I want to commend you and the dedicated public service, servants at DHS who stopped more fentanyl and arrested more drug traffickers in the last two fiscal years than the previous five combined. The President requested emergency supplemental funds for DHS in October of last year. It's now April. And my Republican colleagues have refused to even consider providing these funds that will help combat drug trafficking. Mr. Secretary, how will the supplemental funding requested by the administration support your ongoing efforts to combat fentanyl? Congressman, the supplemental request uh, would provide uh, two very important streams of funding, um, at least. One is for personnel, more investigators, more support staff for those investigators, uh, the, their ability to not only investigate and apprehend traffickers and work both domestically and internationally, but also to resource much needed technology, specifically the non-intrusive inspection technology, which is so remarkably effective at our ports of entry, which are the primary uh, avenues through which smugglers seek to move uh, fentanyl into our country. 
Absolutely, and, uh, and Democrats look forward to getting you those resources so you can continue that important work. The department has done a commendable job step, stopping fentanyl from entering our country. It's worth emphasizing again that DHS has stopped more fentanyl and arrested more drug traffickers in the last two fiscal years than the previous five combined, as I previously mentioned. Mr. Secretary, how does the administration's budget request for fiscal year 25 build on the successes of the last two years? Um, Congressman, it continues to fund uh, our personnel uh, so that we can continue not only to implement the uh, strategic operations that we have underway, but also to build on those operations and develop new ones, uh, deploy personnel to different countries that are source uh, countries, um, and plus up our transnational criminal investigative units where our investigators work with international partners to interdict not only precursor chemicals, but also the equipment used to manufacture fentanyl and the finished product itself. Thank you, and I appreciate, again, all your service to our country. I yield back. Gentleman Yields, I now recognize Ms. Green, the gentlelady from Georgia, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mayorkas, we do not have a country without a secure border, and we cannot have a safe country. We cannot protect our own democracy without protecting our elections. That is a fact. The open border is the number one issue across America in poll after poll. And that is exactly why this committee impeached you. Mr. Secretary, the Oversight Project released a bombshell report last night on your connection to the dark money NGO industrial complex of illegal immigration. I know you saw this from one of my colleagues just earlier. They found flyers throughout the Resource Center Matamoros refugee camp in Mexico telling illegal aliens, reminder to vote for President Biden when you are in the United States. We need another four years of his term to stay open. Eyewitnesses saw the flyers also being handed out to migrants who were using RCM for assistance in coming to the United States. In an audio recording, the founder of RCM, Gabby Zavala, by the way, we maybe should subpoena her to, to the committee, agreed that they need to help as many people as possible before President Trump gets reelected. RCM is an operation that houses functions for the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which helps migrants enter the United States, and you're familiar with their work. We know that you served as a former board member, excuse me, former board member of this group that funds illegal immigration and they're very proud of you, Mr. Secretary. They congratulated you on your nomination. You worked as a board member of an NGO that is working in conjunction with other NGOs, which are not only financing the invasion of the country, but also telling illegal aliens to vote in the United States elections. They are telling illegal aliens, non-citizens, to come vote for Joe Biden. That's your boss. This is corruption at the deepest level. As a matter of fact, I would call it treason. It's treason because these people have declared war on our citizens by raping our women, our children, and murdering people. Like Lakin Riley, you're familiar with her, right? Congressman, our heart breaks. Are you familiar with Lakin Riley? Uh, uh, I am uh, familiar with the case. That you should have deported her so that she could be alive today. Her parents would have appreciated that. And also Kayla Hamilton, who was brutally raped and murdered by a cartel member. Her mother came and spoke to us. She didn't deport him either. You let him in the country. You, Mr. Secretary, have allowed over 10 million illegals, probably higher than that, could be closer to 15 million, we don't know, to invade our country. You've allowed the cartels to make billions and billions. As a matter of fact, you're probably the best business partner they could ever have. They make all this money in human trafficking and drug trafficking at our border. You've allowed approximately 300 Americans to be murdered every single day from fentanyl that comes across our border. And now you're aiding NGOs to steal our elections through your budget. I demand proof of citizenships in our elections, and that is something every single member of Congress should care about. We don't need illegal aliens voting in our elections. We're supposed to be here talking about your budget, 
but we're talking about how money is being used to make sure people coming to our country are able to get a social security number in which they can register to vote. And on that note, Mr. Mayorkas, I demand that Chuck Schumer holds your impeachment trial in the Senate because that's exactly what we should be focused on right now. Mr. Chairman, I yield the remainder of my time. The gentlelady yields. I now recognize Mr. Garcia, the gentleman from California, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. I'm sorry you had to listen to a lot of misinformation right now and throughout uh, this hearing. Um, and I also, just for the, for the record, you are here. You're doing a very difficult job. Even though some folks are trying to uh, remove you from office, we know that's not going to happen. The impeachment sham against you is dead on arrival in the Senate. And so I look forward to you continuing to do a very difficult job uh, for the country and for the administration. Now, I want to just note, since you last testified, we know that um, Donald Trump has also become the presumptive nominee of his party. Uh, immigrants like you and me remember and understand and know his dangerous rhetoric and the way he talks about immigrants like us. But I want to go back to his 2016 words. I think it's important to put those back into the record. Quote, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're, sen they're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. Now, it's interesting because you and I both know that non-citizens are 60% less likely to actually commit crimes than citizens. And so he's just using this xenophobic rhetoric to demonize migrants that are trying, in many cases, searching for a better life and running away from extreme violent positions in their home countries. And this rhetoric we know has continued. Trump calls immigrants who enter the country oftentimes animals. He just did this so recently. And he said, and I quote, this is a quote, Democrats say, please don't call them animals, they're humans. Trump said, quote, I said, no, they're not humans, they're animals. This is dehumanizing rhetoric and it's wrong and unacceptable. Now, Mr. Secretary, does this type of rhetoric fuel violence here in the United States? Um, Congressman, I'm going to, um refrain from opining on the words of a particular candidate given uh, the Hatch Act restrictions. No, I appreciate that. But what I will say, though, is that his rhetoric is wrong and disturbing and his policies are actually worse. And we know that President Trump has said he would immediately launch the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. I want to now note and talk a little bit about something that Donald Trump has also tried to characterize as we talk about migrants. He and his, one of his uh, main lieutenants, Stephen Miller, has promised large-scale raids and actually has suggested using National Guard troops, even sending National Guard troops from Republican-led states into, into neighboring states led by Democrats. And what we're seeing now in Texas, there's real risk there, certainly if we see National Guards being used this way in the future. Can you, you your opinion about the National Guards being used in Texas? I'm sorry, can you repeat the precise Based question? on what we're seeing now in Texas, do you think there's risk, additional risk, that we could see National Guard being used in a way that could be dangerous at the border? Uh, Congressman, um, the deployment of National Guard uh, can be an effective force multiplier when it is coordinated with uh, federal authorities, specifically the United States Border Patrol. When it is not, it um, presents a risk to our efforts to secure the border. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And I think we just, we just saw that recently play out in a, very, in a very dangerous and disturbing way. Now, I want to also note something about the way uh, the incumbent president views migration and the way he views the world. And I think it's important to, to, to point out. We know that in 2016, Donald Trump launched his campaign by pointing out that Mexicans are essentially rapists and murderers. We've seen that already. In 2018, he told members of Congress in the Oval Office when they discussed protecting immigrants from African countries that they didn't want any migrants from what he called shithole countries. And that's his quote, not mine. Trump then suggested that the U.S. should instead bring more people from countries such as Norway, because apparently they're nice immigrants. And let's never, not forget that he tried over and over again to ban Muslims coming from this country as well. All the while, he continues to fool extremism and violence by claiming falsely that he won the 2020 election. Now, Trump continues with his view of the world to attack a legal immigration system that actually works. We know that visas fell every year during Trump's administration. There was a hiring freeze at the U.S. Citizenship and Custom Immigration Service. And his administration has used every possible way of disqualifying and denying visas. 
Mr. Secretary, can you tell us how policies like denying visas actually undermines our situation at the border? Um, Congressman, individuals who qualify for visas um, significantly contribute to the well-being and advancement of this country, uh, and that is um, quite uh, evident, especially in the economic uh, arena. We've seen that with skilled workers, non-skilled seasonal workers, agricultural workers, and many other avenues. Um, we, um, we are enriched uh, by them. Thank you, sir. I think I'm, I'm out of time here, so I'll yield back. Yeah, the gentleman yields. I now recognize Mr. Gonzalez, the gentleman from Texas, for five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Secretary, for being here today. I, I don't want to talk about you. I want to talk about the men and women that serve under you, uh, and particularly um, some of the threats that they're dealing with. This transnational criminal organization, TDA, uh, Tran de Agua, uh, these Venezuelan gangs, they're, they're growing in influence. They're growing in uh, criminal activity throughout the country, and I believe there are a significant threat to our homeland. Uh, and it's not just regional, it's not just Miami, it's not just New York, it's all over the place. So my question is specifically on HSI. What is uh, Homeland Security Investigations doing to tackle TDA? Uh, Congressman, um, Homeland Security Investigations and our sister agencies in the federal government have an unprecedented attack against not only transnational criminal organizations, but domestic operations here as well, and I can provide you with details subsequent to this hearing with respect to our efforts against that specific gang. I would appreciate that. Is HSI part of FBI's transnational anti-gang anti task force? I, I believe it is. The, this is something I think that's important, that we use every leverage, every lever of, of uh, government uh, tools both at the federal, state, and local level to go after these criminals. I'm talking about hardened criminals, bad actors that are in our communities. How do we find them? How do we prevent them from committing crimes? Being part of that, I think HSI is gonna be on the forefront of a lot of that. I'm gonna talk, a, uh, I represent a, larger, a large part of West Texas, and oil and gas is a big part of that. And I was on a recent swing through West Texas where they're seeing a rising, uh, rising amount of oil theft. Uh, and, and, and I bring this up because some of this is tied, a lot of it is tied to this open border crisis. Some of these actors are not American citizens. And so there's this, this oh, what do you do with someone? You pull someone over, they're not a U.S. citizen. Clearly this is where Homeland Security should have a role to play in this. So once again, is, is, do you know if HSI is part of the Permian Basin Oil Field Theft Task Force? Congressman, I'll have to um, find find out I do not know the, the answer to that specific question. I think it would be important if, if, they, if they're not that they, they look into this. Once again, this is an interconnection where it's, uh, you know, how do you use every lever and every tool? And, and part of that, if you pull someone over and they're not a U.S. citizen, Homeland Security has a role to play in that to determine who is this person, right? Why are they here illegally? What do you do with them? What I'm seeing now is in some cases, the local law enforcement will just release them. They will, there, there is no one to turn them over to. And I, you could see this train wreck coming a mile away where we, would have, we have apprehended someone that, once again, I'm not talking about all people. I'm talking about a bad actor that would have been apprehended committing a, let's say, low-level crime or another crime, and then all of a sudden, a year later, a month later, they commit a serious crime. I want to get ahead of that, and I believe HSI is, a big, is going to be a big part of working with the, the FBI and these local and state uh, uh, task forces in order to get that done. I would, I would ask that you bring that to, attention, bring to your attention because energy is a large, it's critical infrastructure. And it's important that we protect that. And I'm seeing this grow. I mean, when I went through uh, the swing a year ago, there was three counties that brought it up. I, I just got done with this thing. Every county brought it up. Every sheriff I'm talking to is bringing it up. And I'm seeing the threat grow. I'm, three, I'm seeing it expand. Uh, my, my last question uh, is on the increase in, uh, in Chinese nationals that we see. Um, I mean, the, the numbers are astronomical. Uh, specifically in, in California and some of those areas. Um, I, I, I know we, what can we do? What, is there anything in particular that we can do to have a direct conversation with China to get this to stop? Clearly this is an issue and it's a rising issue. Uh, China is a difficult actor to deal with. Is there anything in particular that Congress can do in order to prevent China from sending its people over? Congressman, I'd like to consider what legislative action 
uh, would be warranted, but I can assure you uh, that I share your concern with the respect of the issue and have engaged with my counterpart from the People's Republic of China, and we have, in fact, made strides in the removal of Chinese nationals who do not qualify for relief in the United States. I think there I needs share to be your concern. I think there needs to be more of that, and I think it needs to be more public. There needs to be more highlighting of the fact of if you come here illegally from China, we are going to send you back. Uh, with that, I'm going to yield back, Chairman, and I appreciate it. Gentleman yields. Um, I now recognize Mr. Swasey, the gentleman from New York, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I just want to remind my colleagues that you've li lived a great American success story. Uh, you were a political refugee born in Havana, Cuba, uh, came to the United States of America, graduated from law school, became a prosecutor for nine years as an assistant United States attorney. You were appointed as the youngest U.S. attorney in the nation. You were the director of the U.S. citizenship program and Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and now you've achieved this position as Secretary. And I want to thank you for your public service to our country. Uh, I'm new to Congress. I just uh, got elected in February. And uh, I was watching what was going on down here. And it's, it's like, you know, you kind of tune it out a little bit, all the back and forth. And one of the things that I've talked about in my campaign and certainly want to highlight here is that Every problem we face in our country is complicated. Nothing is simple. And you cannot solve complicated problems in an environment of fear and anger, where everybody's just yelling and screaming at each other. It's impossible. You can never get to the, the meat and bones of doing the work that's necessary. And that's why I was excited by the Senate bill, the bipartisan compromise that you worked on along with uh, Senators Lankford and Murphy and Sinema, uh, which didn't have everything I wanted in it, but it was a compromise. And my colleagues, you know, let's say they get everything they want. Let's say Trump is elected. Let's say they get the majority of the Congress. Let's say they get the majority of the Senate. I hope those things don't happen, but let's say it all happens. They, under no circumstances will they get enough votes in the Senate to actually pass a bill. You'll, we'll have to do something bipartisan under any circumstances. And you can't get a bipartisan bill under any circumstances unless people work together. So... Uh, it's great that we got more money for the uh, uh, Customs Border Patrol agents to bring it up to 22,000 in this most 2024 appropriation. And we uh, got more detention beds. But under the Senate bill, we would have gotten more Customs Border Patrol officers as well. And we would have gotten more detention beds. And we would have gotten money for the wall. And we would have gotten money for technology. And we would have gotten money for a whole bunch of other things. And there would have been some serious policy changes. So I just want to use my last half of my time to ask you. I, the thing I'm most uh, interested in and uh, excited about is this idea that we have to reduce the time it takes to adjudicate asylum cases. It seems like that's the most important thing we have to do because right now we've got all these people, you know, the crisis, everybody's freaking out, so many people coming over the border. It seems like it's calmer now, but there'll be a surge again, I'm sure, between now and the sp uh, summer. Uh, but if people have to wait five, six, seven, eight years and they get a work permit in the meanwhile, then that's going to encourage more people to come. If we could cut down that period, as you said earlier, I think you said 90 days, I've heard six months from other people, if we could cut down that period to adjudicate these asylum cases, of which 80% of the people will be denied asylum, and many of whom will be then deported immediately, it'll discourage other people from, from paying the coyotes and, and coming over here to do this stuff. So could you explain to me how we can reduce the time that it takes, what it, what's it gonna take from this body to reduce the time it takes to adjudicate the asylum cases from what is now years down to a matter of months? Congressman, um, uh, you are correct that reducing uh, that time would change the risk calculus of intending migrants and uh, deter them uh, from taking the dangerous journey and spending their life savings in the hands of smugglers. The Senate bipartisan legislation would have delivered on that with changes to the system, policy changes to the system, as well as ample resources for us to implement uh, those fixes. Could you tell us some of the policy changes that would happen that would make the asylum process, we have about another 45 seconds, we would make the asylum process happen more quickly so these can be the issue? Because when everybody, when they get adjudicated, 
80, 80, 70, 80 percent get denied. And then they're not eligible to be here. So if we could speed that up, we'd stop this from happening. What, what, what are the policy changes? Among, among the compromises that the Senate bipartisan legislation included was raising the credible fear standard, shrinking the disparity between that initial threshold screening standard and the ultimate merits standard. It also resourced, Congressman, uh, our system with 4,300 asylum officers uh, to adjudicate those cases much more swiftly. Well, I want, to, I want to thank you again for your public service. Uh, you know, I, I'm saddened when I hear some of the stuff that's being hurled about by different people. It's upsetting. It's not productive. Uh, we have serious business to do. These are serious problems. We don't want people creating crimes and breaking the law. But we've got to work together to solve it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields. I now recognize Mr. LaLota, the gentleman from New York, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, do we have a problem at the southern border? We certainly have a very significant challenge. Yes, we do. Previously, you've uh, characterized that as not a crisis. Are you willing to say today that there is a crisis at the southern border? Congressman, I have said now repeatedly it's a crisis, and I have never minimized the severity of the challenge at the border, regardless of the words that are used. Appreciate the evolution on that. With uh, 200,000 fentanyl deaths, 1.7 million non-citizens being paroled uh, into the country, um, and migrant crises in multiple cities, including New York City, um, how grave is the crisis at the southern border? Congressman, um, uh, the, the situation is grave. It requires solutions, and I strongly support and urge Congress to pass the Senate's bipartisan Great. We're going to get into that in a moment, Mr. Secretary. My colleague uh, from the other side of the aisle, from the county to, to my west, uh, mentioned how some solutions are complicated. Uh, I, I would offer on this, there are some simple solutions uh, which ought to be implemented. And I find it disingenuous um, that many folks from the other side of the aisle often point to budgetary reasons as why we can't have a secure border. Uh, so I want to talk about some non-budgetary reasons, including President Biden's policy choices, specifically his executive orders that he's either issued or rescinded. I think the clerk may have a copy of 64 uh, different, we'll get you on Mr. Secretary, 64 different executive orders that President Biden has issued that have either rolled back Trump-era border policies that many agree have been successful or implemented some that have made your job more difficult. Uh, in the entirety of the four years in the Trump administration, there were 2.4 million encounters in this, uh, on the southwest border. Uh, in the first 40 months of the Biden administration, there were 7.6 million encounters at the southwest border. So comparatively speaking, 200% more in 20% less of a time. Um, should the Department of Homeland Security endeavor to have less alien encounters at the southwest border? Uh, in between the ports of entry, we are driving to reduce the number of encounters. Yes, indeed we are. So it's a goal of yours to have less encounters? Yes. Great. Do less encounters lead to less non-citizens being paroled into the country? Yes, Congressman. Great. Uh, if there are less non-citizens paroled into the country, will there be less migrant crises like the ones in New York? Congressman, um, the source of the challenge in New York City um, uh, is uh, varied. One source of that is a public official's decision to deliberately not communicate. I'm going to reclaim my time, Mr. Secretary. The question was, does less encounters at the border lead to less migrant crises? I'm going to suppose, I'm going to offer that the answer to the question is yes, you may have a different opinion. The, the, the focus I'd like to have is on the Remain in Mexico policy, which was an at when President Biden announced that he was rescinding the Remain in Mexico policy. What do you think went through the, uh, the mind of a migrant from Central or South America, many of whom come here for economic reasons? What do you think went through the mind of that migrant who now know that if, if he or she made it to the southern border, that they would be granted entry, more likely to be granted entry into the country. Congressman, I believe, I believe that the Remain in Mexico um, policy throughout its dur duration, I believe, and I'll, I'll verify this, approximately 70,000 migrants ran through it uh, in the two years it was in operation. And so uh, I do not, uh, I think that you are overemphasizing. Let me ask you a different question about Remain in Mexico. 
Why do it? Why, why repeal Remain in Mexico? What, what is the value to border security by, re, by repealing the policy? Uh, Congressman, it was not an effective policy. It was causing a tremendous amount of human tragedy south of our border. And uh, because it was bad policy, it was rescinded. So, so your testimony is the increase, the 200% increase of migrant encounters at the southwest border in 20% less time is because of COVID? Uh, no, Congressman, I have not uh, testified uh, to that. Uh, the situation and the reasons for it are quite varied. The fact of the matter is that the world is experiencing the greatest displacement of people since World War II, and our hemisphere is not spared that reality. And I'm going to reclaim my time. Mr. Chairman, President Biden should go back to the successful Trump-era border policies. The Senate should take up H.R. 2, the only bill that has passed either chamber in this town. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee, for five minutes of testimony. Our questions. <clears throat> Secretary, I appreciate your presence here today. Uh, as I do um, millions of Americans and the <clears throat> members of this uh, committee who are here seriously to do the work of the American people. Uh, let me, first of all, uh, speak the obvious, since my colleagues uh, want to attribute more money, more money to Democrats. I'm very proud of my legislation, H.R. 3208, uh, which has passed this committee, cyber workforce legislation, that has been drafted, which the committee favorably reported uh, in uh, July, it appears, and would also um, address the question that Mr. Gabarino was speaking about. He has departed um, about uh, your workforce issue. If we would pass a number of legislative initiatives, we might move you along further. And this bill in particular talks about cyber workforce, which is one of my very serious issues. Let's train them. Um, uh, let's uh, give them uh, internships or access, uh, and let's put them to work. And I think if we did that, you would have at least a portion of the battle uh, where you would have a staff that could begin working at Homeland Security. It is a place that I have heard people are interested in working uh, primarily uh, to defend their nation. So let's see if we can do something constructive in this uh, committee. But, but I do want to um, address uh, the question of dealing with the articles of impeachment, uh, willful and systemic refusal to comply with the law. Uh, it's always uh, difficult to ask someone to detail their own uh, failings, frailties. Uh, do you believe, uh, Mr. Secretary, that you have failed to comply with the law? And where would you, where would you uh, do better in complying with the law on behalf of the American people? Congresswoman, uh, I've been in public service, I think, about 22 years. I've taken the oath, I think, five times, maybe six. I've adhered to the oath um, uh, to which I have um, sworn, and um, I have abided by the law each and every step of the way. When your question is asked over and over again, and this is for the American people, if you're still tuning in about whether the southern border is secure, they need that answer. And so I would ask the question, as someone who uh, believes that you do the best with what you have and you work hard, um, and that we owe the American people the duty of a secure border, what more would you do um, if that was the question and the answer was that we need to do more? What more would you do to secure the American border if you felt that was necessary um, and uh, that you wanted to tell the American people this is what I needed to have? Congresswoman, we are dealing with a fundamentally broken immigration system. That is our fundamental problem. Um, and I would uh, encourage Congress to pass a bipartisan Senate legislation uh, that would bring tremendously advancing reform to the broken immigration system, and it would also resource our department to execute those reforms advantageously. It seems a simple uh, proposition to me, and throughout the entire questioning that I've decided to sit and listen, I've heard no offering of a resolution by my friends on the other side of the aisle. There is absolutely nothing to answer the second article of impeachment, 
breach of public trust, uh, and that is uh, that uh, we know that uh, Congress has the sole power of impeachment, um, and that you shall be removed for the breach of uh, trust, then what is that breach? What is your belief is a breach of trust? Uh, Congresswoman, I'm not aware of any, and uh, let me assure you uh, that I do not spend time on the impeachment proceedings. I focus my attention exclusively on the work of the Department of Homeland Security. We do know that, and that is an answer that I wish some of our colleagues who decide to not be here for that to be able to listen. We do know that Iran, for example, is a major proponent of terrorism, um, and they decided to exercise that definition by bombarding Israel with 300 um, of the um, missiles uh, that they um, decide to use, the drones that they decide to use against uh, an ally uh, for this horrible attack. What then would you give as an answer? Did, did we, the United States, generate an attack on uh, Israel? Was that our doing? Uh, no, it was not, uh, Congressman. And are we prepared to be supportive uh, in, in helping to defend our homeland? We most certainly are, Congressman. We do that every single day through the extraordinary work of 268,000 men and women in our department. And you haven't seen anybody stand up and, and resign and say, I'm frightened, I don't want to do this work, I don't want to protect the homeland. Have you seen that occur today? I, I have not, and people risk their lives every single day on behalf of our country, the, both in the department, in other departments, and of course, um, in our in our branches of the military. Well, let me the general lady's time has Chairman expired, and, and I now recognize no, no lady's no time has expired, the and we're having to MP. insist on the five minutes. I know because he would of the want time me to say that, Mr. Chairman. I see general no lady is not recognized. For the gentleman I, to be in general lady is not recognized. I, no I now recognize Mr. Ezel, the gentleman from Mississippi. I thank the chairman. There's no reason for him to be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Secretary Mayorkas. Uh, your open border policies have granted parole to a host of illegal aliens from regions in the Middle East and West Africa that are known for hotbeds for terrorism. Clearly, this administration's policies have emboldened countries such as Iran, like what we saw over the weekend with their attacks on Israel. Can you tell me confidently that uh, this committee that no current or former Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps members or members of Islamic terrorist organizations have been granted parole into the United States. Congressman, let me assure you that an individual who poses a threat to our national security is a priority for detention and removal. What about anyone from the People's Liberation Army of the Chinese Communist Party? Same answer, Congressman. Mr. Secretary, I want to switch to DHS violation for Americans on free speech. Uh, four months ago, the Assistant Secretary of Cyber for, uh, at DHS testified at the Oversight Subcommittee that, I quote, countering disinformation that threatens the homeland and providing the public with accurate information and response are critical to fulfilling DHS' congressionally mandated missions, unquote. Secretary De Mayorkas, do you believe Congress has given DHS the authority to use censorship to counter disinformation? Congressman, we do not uh, censor free speech. We abide by the First Amendment. Secretary Mayorkas, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in Missouri versus Biden found that CISA, and I quote again, likely significantly encouraged the social media platforms content moderation decisions and ther thereby violated the First Amendment. Do you know, uh, did you know your agency was pressuring social media platforms to censor Americans? Congressman, uh, we do not um, uh, censor speech. We do not pressure platforms uh, to do so. And I believe the trial court's uh, ruling uh, was um, uh, reversed in part uh, by the appellate court. I cannot speak further because I believe the litigation uh, continues. Documents recently obtained through the Freedom of Information Act FOI show that DHS argued the agency has the authority to regulate misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. However, the content of these documents has been redacted. I've questioned members of CISA regarding this and was not satisfied with their response. So I'll ask you, what congressional authorities does DHS have in the MDM space? Oh, let me give you some uh, real-life examples of the work that we do, Congressman, because I'm sure 
you will support it when um, human smuggling organizations spread disinformation with respect to the policies of the Department of Homeland Security, we publish accurate information with respect to our policies. When criminal organizations domestically in the wake of a natural disaster spread uh, disinformation uh, to victims of that natural disaster to deceive them to fall prey to those criminal organizations, we provide accurate information with respect to what FEMA does and does not do. When, an when a foreign adversary spreads disinformation with respect to the processes of our elections, for example, if you, if you don't make it to the voting booth on time on Tuesday, don't worry, you can vote on Wednesday. We actually communicate accurate information with respect to the election process in coordination with state and local officials. That is the type of work that we do, and I know that you endorse that work wholeheartedly given the fact that it is about enforcing the law and making sure that people do not fall prey to criminals who do not seek to enforce the law. Will the gentleman, will the gentleman yield first? Yes. Mr. Secretary, are we, is DHS able to touch each individual that the nefarious actors are touching? Now, I, and I respect that what you just told us, but my concern is, and I hope this is happening, but is DHS able to reach out to all the bodies that the, the nefarious actors are engaging with with the right information to oppose the negative information? We, um, uh, we seek to disseminate the accurate information as broadly as possible. And Does that live on the site, DHS site, or is it in the social media platforms? We, we, we have um, uh, web pages that disseminate and broadcast that, and we also use force multipliers our state, local, tribal, territorial partners, uh, state and local law enforcement, et cetera. Congressman. That's fine. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize Mr. Swalwell, the gentleman from California and the ranking member on the Subcommittee of Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security. Mr. Secretary, welcome back, and thank you and the men and women at your department for what they're doing uh, during this especially uh, vulnerable time uh, for the homeland. You know, I, I know it's probably not comfortable for you, you know, to have any of us reference uh, the impeachment that Speaker Johnson brought to the floor, but I just want to get some dates right. Was it February 13 when uh, Speaker Johnson uh, was finally able to get the votes uh, to impeach you? Was that the date? I don't, um, okay. I don't recall. The I think it was, the, it was February 13. And uh, by the way, uh, it was kind of a second serve uh, impeachment, if we're using like a tennis analogy. The first one uh, was a fault. Uh, they couldn't get the votes. Uh, in pickleball, you would have only gotten one serve and that would have been it. But if it was tennis, they got a second serve and barely were able to do it. Uh, today, it's April 16, so you know I'm not great at math, but I think that's two months. Um, have the impeachment articles as we sit here today, been sent over to the Senate for a trial, are you aware? Um, I don't know whether something has occurred uh, while I have been testifying before this committee, Congressman. And I only bring that up because again, like we were told there's this urgency, there's this crisis at the border, we gotta do this now. We gotta you know, bring one of our you know, colleagues who's you know, suffering and going through uh, cancer treatments that we're all rooting for. We gotta bring him out of those treatments so he can come and be the pivotal vote so that we can get you impeached and sent over to the Senate. It's been two months, two months, and it's still not over at the Senate. So I, I don't think it's the urgency that we were told. It, it seems like it was more the former president wanted us to do this, and so Speaker Johnson did it, and we seem to go wherever the former president wants us to go, if that's on border policy, if that's on funding Ukraine. Uh, it's, it's not really an America first agenda. It's me, me, me first when it comes to the former president. And then these guys get kind of dragged along, and that's why the articles, as we sit here today, have still not been sent over. But I want to talk a little bit about disinformation. Does Russia or China or Iran or Venezuela have a right to free speech uh, in our elections, as you see it? I'm not sure I understand your question, but... Well, Americans have a right on social media platforms to to speak freely about our elections, but do you see our adversaries as having a right to pollute our public forum uh, when it comes to speech? Congressman, uh, one of our, um, uh, one of the threat streams 
uh, attacking the integrity of our elections is disinformation from uh, adverse nation states. That includes the People's Republic of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. And I also find it interesting, you know, my colleagues, some of them don't like that you're going after disinformation, but one of our very able staffers just provided me with a July 11, 2018 transcript in this room when the former president, Donald Trump, uh, was president, and you have a number of Republican members who are arguing that it's actually disinformation. That's the problem. You have, you have multiple Republican members saying that disinformation is our foreign adversary's tool of choice, uh, as Mr. Rogers uh, on this committee at the time said. Mr. Perry, we know Mr. Perry uh, from January 6th, uh, he also uh, goes into identifying foreign disinformation as being the problem. So, again, what we want the department to do is not to choose sides politically because we know that our adversaries, first and foremost, they just want chaos so that they can go to their authoritative, their authoritarian states and say, this is why democracy doesn't work. Look what's going on in America. And they're undermining it. Um, but would you say that when you look at disinformation and, and when you see disinformation, that it doesn't have a, a straight line as far as benefiting one party or, or the other, that our adversaries really, more than anything, just want chaos in America? Um, adverse nation states um, seek to our, attack our, our nation, uh, our democracy, um, this country. And uh, we uh, battle uh, their efforts uh, every single day. Yeah. Well, again, Mr. Secretary, uh, thank you for what you do. We're, we're grateful that you're uh, in the chair that you're in. It's not an easy place uh, to sit. Uh, and uh, I'm confident that there will be a swift acquittal uh, if it ever gets sent over to the Senate. Uh, and I yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. D'Esposito, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary. Thank you for being here uh, this morning, or now this afternoon. Uh, have you read H.R. 2? Congressman, it's been a while since I have, but uh, I certainly reviewed the legislation. Okay, and, and were there any parts of H.R. 2 that you agreed with? Congressman, I'd have to review it again. Uh, it, was, it was the most comprehensive border security bill that has been passed uh, out of the House of Representatives in decades. You're the Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, you're not certain or sure of any of the items in that legislation that you would agree with? Congressman, let me assure you that I uh, support the Senate's bipartisan legislation. I'm not asking about the Senate's bipartisan legislation. I'm asking about H.R. 2, the only piece of border security legislation that has been passed through the House of Representatives. We continue to talk about this bipartisan legislation, this magical legislation that has yet to make it out of the Senate, that doesn't have the support to make it out of that. But we still have the administration, the Secretary of Homeland Security, telling us that we should support legislation that can't get passed. You don't remember any parts of H.R. 2 that you support. That is, um, Congressman, I can share with you some of the grave infirmities Okay. of H.R. 2. I'm asking for the parts that, that you support because my point is, is that back in May, House Republicans out of this committee passed H.R. 2, the Secure the Border Act. We sent it over to the Senate. That should have begun the, the, the negotiation. That should have been the starting point to secure our border. I've heard colleagues on the other side of the aisle say that people in America are, quote, freaking out, that there's chaos, yes, People are freaking out. Yes, there is chaos because Joe Biden and the Homeland Security has left our borders wide open. That's why people are freaking out. And there is a solution. It was H.R. 2. Do I agree with everything in there? Absolutely not. I would assume you don't agree with a lot of things in there either. Democrats didn't agree with things in there, but you know what it was? It's the only piece of legislation that we actually have. It's the perfect starting point. So to my colleagues on the other side who are talking about this magical piece of legislation, we have it. It's H.R. 2. So let's start there. Now I'm going to take it back home. So time after time, this committee has listened to the devastating impact that the border crisis has 
uh, of course, because of the policies that have been implemented by you and President Biden. You have helped make every state a border state, every county a border county, and every city a border city, including my home in New York. Now, a Democrat mayor, who I don't agree with on everything, but I agree with him on this, he said that, quote, this issue will destroy New York City. Now, I'm proud to have served in the NYPD as a detective, and it has been absolutely devastating to see the horrific challenges that law enforcement are faced with throughout this country. I mean, just recently, we saw NYPD cops who were attacked by illegal migrants who just got done robbing a target. Months ago, we saw NYPD officers brutally attacked in Midtown Manhattan. They actually were our guests at the State of the Union by illegal migrants. We saw in the Bronx recently where there was a 911 call made for a person with a gun. When cops made their way into this home into the Bronx, it was illegal migrants who had squatted there illegally and had illegal guns and illegal narcotics. Then just days after, in my district, in Roosevelt Field Mall, there were two migrants who committed larceny in a, in, in a store, were arrested by the Nassau County Police Department, and guess what the address was that they gave? That home in the Bronx where the guns and the narcotics were found. So I'm gonna ask you, can you tell me at what part of this budget request would better support law enforcement? Oh, Congressman, uh, quite a number of, of, par of parts. Uh, the additional uh, personnel request, the funding for additional law enforcement personnel in the Department of Homeland Security. Do you know that in HR2 that there was money in there for additional law enforcement? In addition, Congressman, uh, the, the grant funds that we are seeking to distribute to state and local law enforcement through the Homeland Security Grant Program, the Urban Area Security Initiative, and other programs. So everything that you just mentioned was part of HR2. So it seems like you do, knew, you do know what you agree with in that legislation. And to my point, that is exactly where she, we, we should start. So I urge my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, let's work on this as Americans. HR2 is our starting point. Gentlemen, Mr. Gentlemen, Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize Ms. Clark from uh, New York for her five minutes of question. Thank Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your hard work, your dedication, and your, your fidelity to, to our nation. It is inspiring. Uh, notwithstanding all of the challenges that uh, my uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, present to you, at the end of the day, you have kept the homeland safe during your tenure, and we're grateful for that. I want to respond to a false allegation raised by some of my Republican colleagues about non-citizens voting in federal elections. First of all, federal law already prohibits non-citizens from voting in federal elections, and there is absolutely zero evidence that there are significant violations of that law. Republicans' efforts to make it harder to vote will disenfranchise low-income and minority voters, and will do nothing to make our elections more secure. Instead, we should focus on the real threats to our election security, which include foreign interference efforts, which I know Secretary Mayorkas is committed to addressing. And additionally, I'm deeply disturbed by Congresswoman Green's attacks on Hyas, originally known as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, an organization that has been supporting refugees for over 140 years. Baseless conspiracy theories about Hyas fueled the anti-Semitic murder of 11 individuals at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. And it's disgraceful to see the same kind of misinformation repeated in this committee. So I wanted that on the record. Um, Mr. Secretary, last month, CISA issued the notice of proposed rulemaking for mandatory cyber incident reporting, and I congratulate the department on this important milestone. Now that the NPRM is out, DHS must redouble, redouble its efforts to harmonize incident report rules across government. The Department's Cyber Incident Reporting Council, CERC, will play a critical role in that process. Secretary Mayorkas 
CERC issued a report containing recommendations regarding the harmonization cyber incident reporting rules last September. What actions has the CERC taken since the report was released to promote harmonization? And what more can the CERC be doing to promote harmonization? Thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman, for your question. We are uh, working with federal departments and agencies across the administration to execute on the imperative of harmonizing mm -hmm. our reporting rules. Not only that, Congresswoman, we are working with our international partners so that harmonization <coughs> would not be restricted to the domestic environment, but the international arena as well. That's good news. As part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, Congress provided $1 billion in grants to state, local, and tribal and territorial governments to strengthen their cyber defenses. This program is based on bipartisan legislation I offered, authored with my colleagues on this committee. Unfortunately, this funding expires in FY 2025, which could mean state and local governments cut their cybersecurity spending, even as they continue to face serious cybersecurity threats, including from foreign adversaries like China and Russia. It's my hope that this committee will work together to extend the vital program so we can build our initial investment. Secretary Mayorkas, do you agree with me that state and local governments will continue to need federal support as they defend their cyber intrusions? And will you commit to working with me and this committee to reauthorize the state and local cybersecurity grant program? I do and I will, Congresswoman. Wonderful. And Mr. Secretary, just one other note of concern, and that's with the uh, nation of Haiti. Um, you should have received a, a letter or been CC'd on a letter uh, regarding the concern about um, individuals being returned uh, at this stage who um, could be sent into harm's way, into famine, into the myriad of challenges that that nation continues um, to face uh, in this moment. I look forward to speaking with you further about this. Um, it's a major concern for many constituencies, many families across um, this nation of Haitian descent. The general, the general lady yield. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sure. Yes, I will yield. Thank you so very much. I wanted to follow your line of questioning very quickly, which is a very important line of questioning, and, th and that is to uh, ensure that we get fixed, Mr. Secretary, what is broken. Sometimes um, we have equipment, technology that is not uh, working correctly. I'd like to submit into the record, as unanimous consent, healthcare.gov, in ineffective. Uh, planning and oversight practices underscore the need for improved contract management. Will you continue to prove, uh, to continue to uh, access getting our equipment refunded or improved so that we can work with equipment that will help you do the job? Yes, so, so ordered, and it's entered into the record, and uh, the gentlelady's time has expired. Thank I now rec I thank you for yielding. You Absolutely. Uh, I now recognize the gentlelady, uh, Ms. Lee, from Florida for five minutes of question. Secretary Mayorkas, I'd like to continue the discussion about the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency and specifically the Chemical Facilities Anti-Terrorism Standards Program uh, that is overseen by CISA. The CFATS program, would you please describe for us how your budget provides continued support for the CFATS program? Um, Congresswoman, I'll have to um, r remind myself of the specific funding for that program. That funding is very important, and of course it has been in tremendous peril uh, recently. We strongly support the continuation of the CFATS program. It enables us to ensure that high-risk chemical facilities are as secure as they need to be. And would you agree that a continuation of that program is an important part of, of the mission to protect critical infrastructure? I would, Congresswoman. And would you also encourage our, our friends and partners over in the Senate to take up the bill that was passed by the House and is currently there awaiting their consideration and action? Uh, Congresswoman, I will look forward to reviewing um, uh, that bill again, but we do indeed consider the CFATS program to be very important. And I'd like to then return to the subject of CISA and its role in elections infrastructure and its efforts to help uh, state and local election officials protect elections infrastructure. Uh, specifically there, could you describe what CISA does to help state and local elections officials defend against threats from foreign adversaries uh, and domestic adversaries to that infrastructure? Congresswoman, 
one of the things we do is uh, provide training with respect to the threat, to be able to identify the threat. We share best practices. We have um, uh, um, marked election security as one of the six priority areas in some of our Homeland Security grant programs to ensure that state and local jurisdictions uh, devote needed resources uh, to a fundamental need of our country, and that is to safeguard the integrity of our election processes. And moving to the question of breaches and cyber attacks, uh, what efforts is CISA making to bolster its own internal cybersecurity? I know they were victim to a recent cyber attack. Uh, can you describe for us the efforts internal to uh, CISA on cybersecurity? Uh, Congresswoman, so that is a, uh, a priority for the department as a whole. Our chief information officer um, and uh, that team uh, is uh, consistently working day in and day out to enhance our uh, security. In addition, uh, CISA works to enhance the cybersecurity of the federal civilian domain. It issues binding operational directives based on what it learns from particular incidents to ensure that agencies and departments are patching or protecting themselves against detected vulnerabilities. This is a very significant mission area of ours. The cybersecurity threat vector is not, unfortunately, diminishing. Related to HSI, I'd like to go back to that subject, uh, which you ad addressed earlier as it related to uh, some transnational gang activities. Uh, but specifically within your budget, I'd like to discuss HSI and its operations related to child exploitation and human trafficking. Uh, your budget calls for additional funding there uh, to help HSI investigators combat human trafficking, does it not? Yes, it does. Okay. And would you explain for us uh, the types of activities and role that HSI takes specifically as it relates to the exploitation and trafficking of children? Congresswoman, um, I named uh, Crimes of Exploitation, uh, one of our six mission priorities for the first time in the department's history. Tomorrow I will be with HSI, Homeland Security Investigations, in New York City, um, launching a new campaign against online child sexual exploitation and abuse. This is a scourge that is not only nationwide, but is global in nature. More than 36 million tips were uh, presented to enforcement authorities across the world. Domestically, more than 63,000 of them reflected an imminent or grave threat. The extent of this crime cannot be overstated. The work of HSI in combating it is heroic, both in uh, disseminating uh, education and awareness, in investigating uh, the crimes, in rescuing victims, and holding perpetrators accountable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentlelady yields. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Latrell, for five minutes of questioning. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. Uh, my colleague has actually just kind of initiated the conversation that I wanted to have with you as well. Um, you're having discussions with HSI, HIDA, DPS, out of the state of Texas. One of the biggest issues that they are confronted with is their ability to navigate aggregated data on the criminals that are mm -hmm. moving the individuals into sex trafficking space. Um, are, you, are you comfortable with the amount of money that you're asking for in the cyber risk, cyber threat domain, and the artificial intelligence and machine learning space? Because they're two different entities that need to work very well together. And my concern is that the right hand is not talking to the left. We need to expand the ability for our agents to process the data. And in, in the budget proposal, there's only $5 million for the new AI office. Are you happy with that number? Uh, Congressman, um, uh, we are pleased with receiving additional uh, funding. When it comes to crimes of exploitation, I must tell you uh, that if I had a wish list, the, the amount of money would be greater. The amount of personnel that we could dedicate to this uh, would be greater. This uh, scourge, this heinous crime, um, is um, of extraordinary breadth and depth of depravity, and we work every day. It is remarkable what our personnel do to combat this. 
with our state and local partners, as well as our international partners. This is one of the top issues that is raised when I am engaging in the international arena with our Five Eyes partners, as well as our European Union colleagues. I, I hate to speak for the body itself, but I think we're really hungry and have a good appetite for the expansiveness, expansiveness of AI in this space. Um, I'm, this is where I'm gonna tell you to be hyper aggressive in order to save these women and children that are in this problem set. Congresswoman, uh, Congressman. Damn, that's the third that's time you've done that to me. I, I tell you, I, I don't even know where to go with that. Con I was hoping you weren't going to do that. Congressman. Uh, I mean, I'm, we go into the pronouns and all that stuff. Just, Congressman, uh, uh, three strikes and I'm out. I, I, I understand that. Um, let, me, let me share with you that we are indeed harnessing AI to advance the mission in the fight against uh, online child sexual exploitation. At the same time, AI presents a risk because um, the perpetrators use it to advance their depraved criminality. And so, Congressman, uh, this is something that we are harnessing for good and fighting against bad. That's where I was going earlier. When we, uh, Do we have the ability to touch the individuals that are being touched by the bad actors? I, I'm, I'm hoping we do, and I know that's an, a, a very a, aggressive problem set. Um, I'm going to roll right on you. Uh, to, to immigration. Um, and the Senate bill, I never even saw it. So just give me a little latitude on this one. I think you're the 14th Homeland Secretary, if I count. Is that, is that correct? You're number 14? I am the seventh confirmed. Seventh confirmed? Okay. Um, I don't know where I got 14. I thought it was on Wikipedia. Whatever. Okay. Mr. Hunter, this Deputy Secretary Hunter, was in front of the Border Security Subcommittee a few weeks ago and we were talking immigration issues, immigration policy. And I had asked, tasked, requested, because in your opening statement, you said Congress has not reformed immigration since the 90s. Well, it is our job to pass legislation, but the subject matter experts in immigration live underneath your umbrella. I consider you, the, are you a subject matter expert in immigration, sir? I, um, I certainly am admiring of those who know much more than I. Um, my ask was, and I was Mr. Swazi and Ms. Ramirez were in agreement with this, it would seems that the frontline operators are the best to address the immigration issue and where the, the, the blockade is, where the choke point is. Has a policy ever been written from the department and sit, sent up to Congress? Because I've never seen one. So I'm asking you, have you done that in your tenure as secretary? Have I myself submitted policy recommendations. No, rewritten the policy that Mr. Garcia holds up frequently in our hearings that you can't even read. It is the absolute problem. Has the, the Homeland Security Department itself said, you know what, here's a problem set. Congress can't get anything done for the last 20 something years. We're gonna write it for you, submit it. This is the best course of action. Has Homeland Security done that? There, 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 there are two powerful examples. Number one, on his first day in office, President Biden presented legislation to Congress. Secondly, I had the privilege and the honor of sitting uh, beside the bipartisan group of senators who worked out a compromise that I urged Congress uh, to pass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gen you back. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Strong, for five minutes of testimony. Or Secret question. Thank you. Secretary uh, Mayorkas, uh, thank you for being here to speak uh, on the FY25 presidential budget request. The president's budget request reflects the administration's priorities, correct? It does, Congressman. I'd like to talk about the threats to Homeland and DHS uh, that we see according uh, to your budget request. I was pleased last year that you acknowledged the threat that unmanned um, aircraft systems pose at our southern border, saying in part that I quote, Drones are being used in a, a myriad of ways, a number of different ways to create uh, a public safety risk, close quotes. You and I agree on this point. The cartels use the drones at the border in a, uh, is alarming. From using them to track the movement of border patrol agents to providing uh, overwatch for human smuggling to transporting narcotics and even outfitting them with expos uh, explosive payloads. While uh, for each drone that the CBP uh, flies, the Mexican cartel flies 17, based on the last information I got. This issue hasn't improved since last year. In fact, 
Last month in a Senate hearing, NORAD Commander General uh, Geo testified that the number of drone incursions alarmed him, saying that he has, quote, talked to CBP who are responsible for UAS incursions at the border, and they put the number of incursions at thousands. He went on to say that he sees the potential of a, a threat posed by drones to the national defense as only growing. Secretary is uh, counting the illicit use of drones at the border a priority for DHS and CBP? Congressman, uh, it certainly is. Um, it's very concerning and very confusing to me. This uh, is your budget request for CBP's counter UAS program. You see it right behind me. Zero, not one penny. Not one penny, and the threat is unbelievable. As the use of drones by bad actors at our border uh, evolves and continues to bring a threat to our homeland, it is unconscionable that you wouldn't request a single penny for CBP to carry out its counter UA UAS mission. You requested zero. Thousands of UAV flights into U.S. airspace by Mexican cartel have uh, the ability, you know, we've got the ability to block, drop, or intercept these drones. Moving on, I want to revisit the ICE detention bed uh, issue that my colleagues have mentioned today. As illegal aliens continue to pour across the southern border, your FY25 budget requests funding for just 34,000 ICE beds, barely half of the 60,000 beds requested by the Trump administration in FY21. In May of 2021, uh, you testified in the House subcommittee hearing that uh, you are, quote, concerned about the overuse of detention, close quote. Is it safe to presume that this is why you want to cut bed space and release illegal aliens on the streets of America? Uh, Congressman, um, it is not my desire to cut detention beds. And I should say, returning the counter UAS Authorities, uh, we are seeking to harness artificial intelligence uh, to amplify the strength of our counter UAS capabilities. Well, I'll tell you this right here on the UAS, UAS. We have the technology. Matter of fact, in my community where I live in Huntsville, Alabama, where we could block them, drop them, or intercept them, it's being used in Ukraine. It's being used in Israel. The only thing is that capability, you've got to request it to make sure that it happens. So I'll promise you, I hope that we can come to a reason because when those uh, UAVs are coming into America, setting down, dropping fentanyl, being stuffed full of cash, and flying back to the Mexican cartel, it's totally unacceptable, and I take you for your word that you're going to do something about it. If Congress is willing to fund even more ice bed space or near uh, Trump era levels, would this be a solution to detaining more illegal aliens? Congressman, um, the greater the, the detention capacity, the greater our ability to detain more people. Uh, the bipartisan Senate legislation um, uh, funded 50,000 detention beds, and that's a powerful example. Thank you, One Mr. Secretary. Example. Mr. Secretary, at the beginning of 2022, you testified to Congress that you had operational control of the border. Then the following hearings, you backtracked to alter uh, the de definition of uh, operational control. Now in 2024, in a hearing last week, you testified that we have a crisis at the southern border. Are you finally admitting to what the American people have known to be true that your border policies don't work. Just Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Burkeen, for five minutes of question. I thank the chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm really concerned about real ID compliance, so I want to shift a, a narrative to discuss that. Uh, which would be a part of budget implementation. Real ID, um, you know, under your administration, says by 2025 uh, there will be compliance. Um, it was designed, supposed to build confidence in the identity of travelers uh, post 9-11 to protect our U.S. citizenry. That's how it was sold when it was passed years ago. Under your leadership, the department um, is going to start implementing this. This Trans Tran Transportation Security Administration, TSA, will be prohibited from accepting driver's license and identification cards that don't meet certain standards, federal standards. You've said that you're continuing to work closely with U.S. states to meet the I real ID requirements. So here's where I'm going to take this. I've heard from two Illinois state lawmakers that illegals in their states, they've got verification, are now able to obtain real ID compliant driver's license. 
Um, I want to reiterate that. In Illinois, illegal aliens now can get real ID compliant driver's license with, by checking the box on, quote, employment authorization document, which is one of the subsets on the state uh, website that, re that is required by the state of Illinois as an option. It can be obtained by this illegal, um, but it's, it, it comes under the parole, which has been something that's been implemented by you in this administration. And so with that parole, this employment authorization document um, box can be checked. And this, in my opinion, and I think that most Americans would say this totally undermines Real ID compliance given the lack of background checks that goes into knowing who these people are. There's a real lack of information. Yes, you can do some Interpol. Yes, you can do some background checks. But you have, uh, in terms of the United States' ability to understand who these people really are, we don't. Um, is Real ID compromised? I believe it is. And I think this is a glaring uh, fault in the system. And so I'm going to go to a quick question to you, yes or no. Should illegal aliens get Real ID driver's license? Congressman, I, I look forward to following up with you on the integrity of the Real ID program as it is envisioned and we are phasing in. That has been a program. Because I've got limited time, Mr. Secretary. Yes or no, should Real ID, should Real ID, should illegal aliens have the option, in your opinion, to, to get Real ID compliant driver's licenses? Um, yes or no? Congressman, I look forward to following up with you. On okay, I, I wish you had a no on that. This, next question. Should illegal aliens vote? As, as Illinois and in New York, we know that they're voting. Should illegal aliens be allowed to vote in this country, yes or no? It is, it is my understanding that illegal aliens cannot vote in federal elections. Can, are they allowed to vote? The answer is yes. In New York and, and in, in Illinois, they are allowed to vote. And, and so whether it's federal elections or others, my question to you all ago, I'd love your answer. Should they be allowed to vote? Congressman, that uh, policy issue is outside uh, the remit of the Department okay. of Homeland Security. It is our obligation. I need to move on for time. I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Secretary, you have contended that the entire, quote, the entire hemisphere is gripped with a level of migration that is unprecedented in recent history, end of quote. You said that more or less today in your opening statement. Um, I, I think that this avoids accountability uh, for the invasion of our southern border. I think it, it, it shifts the blame uh, on random events. Um, but if that narrative is to be understood or, or um, followed, what are those events? I mean, I'm, I look around the world and I go in South America, was there some uh, tsunami? Was there a hurricane that I was not aware of? Um, but the answer is no. Um, it ultimately, is, it, for those who have the context of the Wizard of Oz, it's like the wizard standing at the microphone saying, disregard the, the, the man as the curtain's being pulled back by the little dog, Toto, disregard the man standing behind the curtain pulling levers and spinning wheels. I mean, I think the American people have this figured out. The migration is because it's been an advertisement under this administration, come in to this country. Um, you know, I come from the Sooner State in Oklahoma, Sooner State. History designates legal land run occurred in the 1880s. This was not for illegals. This was for legal um, citizens. History will remember this time, I believe, in the past three years as Biden's land run for illegals, paid for by U.S. taxpayers. Taxpayers are being asked to give their treasure and their children's treasure of the future for this. Fair organization says it cost us $4,000 for every illegal immigrant. A gold rush to transport illegals to the city of their choice free emergency health care, and then once these people have a child, there's cash payments in the form of, of earned income tax credits, thousands of dollars, food stamps once they have a child, food stamps once they have a, a child, or uh, once they have a child again, Medicaid on top of the food stamps. So here's where I'm going with this. Does your budget pr proposed, which I will contend it does, especially the one that you know we're deeming as the slush fund, allow for dollars? To, to go into countries as far south as Pan Panama for NGOs, non-government organizations, to promote people coming to our country and effect telling military-aged men, go north, young men, go north. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Crane uh, from Arizona for five minutes questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, it's interesting because I hear my colleagues on the other side of the aisle consistently talk about how we can't agree on anything over here on the Republican side of the aisle. You know, and there's some truth to that. There has been, you know, definitely some debates, some arguments within our own party. Um, but one thing that we can agree upon is that you're doing a horrible job, sir, and that you needed to be impeached. That's pretty wild, seeing as how we've been able to agree upon very few things and with the, with the margin that we have. But we could all come together, look at the data, hear the stories back in the district, 
Listen to the family members that have been destroyed because of your complete dereliction of duty. And we all agree that you needed to be impeached. Secretary Mayorkas, did you swear an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States? Yes, I did, Congressman. Yeah, how many times have you done that? Um, I certainly can identify five when I... Okay, thank you. In. Are you aware of Article 4, Section 4? Do you know what that... Do you know what that uh, article is? There may be more than five instances. I just want to be okay. clear to the Yeah, best. okay, great. Article 4, Section 4, are you, are you familiar with that article? When I was sworn in as an assistant. Okay, since you're not going to answer, it's called the Invasion Clause. Do you know what the Invasion Clause says, sir? The second time was... The federal government will protect and defend each state from invasion, Okay. Since you don't seem to be getting it, I had our staff here bring up this graph here. This is you. This is the last administration. Again, you, last administration. That looks like an invasion on a graph. We've heard from the people that have sat here and testified in these chambers about their family members being raped and murdered by people that weren't supposed to be here that your administration allowed to be here and then didn't keep track of, didn't deport, didn't detain. Tell me, sir, how you haven't allowed an invasion into this country. Uh, Congressman, I am incredibly proud to support the men and women of the Department of Homeland Security who enforce the laws of the United States every single day, many of whom risk their lives to secure our borders. Yeah, despite your horrific leadership, yes, they do. And I'm proud to know many of them as well. They are great people, but we all know that we all know what the morale is like in the Border Patrol right now, and it's horrible. I hear it from Border Patrol agents every day. Again, sir, my question is, how have you not violated your oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States, specifically Article 4, Section 4, which says that you, as Homeland Security, will protect each state from invasion, again, you... Last administration. How can you make that argument? I work every day quite proudly to advance the security of the border and support the men and women of the Department of Homeland You may be security. working every day, but it seems as if you're working for the other side of the aisle. It seems as if you're working for our enemies. And that's exactly what the American people see. That's exactly why they supported us impeaching you. And that's exactly why you had so many members of this conference that is often divided come together to impeach you, sir. Let me ask you this question, Secretary Mayorkas. Do you think our enemies are stupid? Congressman, uh, you could launch whatever false and deplorable Do you think our adversaries are stupid, sir? Congressman, our adversaries uh, uh, vary in capability, uh, and um, we address the defense of the United States and the interests of the United States accordingly. No, you're not. Okay, you are not doing that. As a matter of fact, do you think it's possible that maybe some of our adversaries, the most dangerous ones like the Chinese, the North Koreans, the Iranians, the Russians, etc., might employ unconventional warfare and send their soldiers because our border is wide open through the southern border without a uniform, without firearms, with instructions to wreak havoc in this country once they're here, once you've allowed them to be here? Do you think that's possible, Secretary Mayorkas? Congressman, over the last 11 months, we have removed or returned 630,000 people, uh, more than any fiscal year since 2013. And well, our, you're bragging about how much you've returned, but you don't want to brag about how many you've let in, do you? Congressman, individuals um, who arrive and claim asylum are placed in immigration enforcement proceedings. If they do not qualify for relief under our laws, we seek to remove them in enforcing our laws. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen Neils, uh, the members of the committee may have some additional questions for you, Mr. Marikis, or Mr. Secretary, uh, and we would ask that you'd respond to those in writing. And I think there were several during that we, that the time kind of fell, and uh, I'll, I'll let those members send those to you uh, for you to follow up on. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7D, the hearing record will be held open for 10 days. Um, and I, I think the ranking member has a unanimous consent request uh, and also a closing statement. So I'll just let you do those together, Mr. Ranking Member. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent 
that portions of the July 18th, 2018 hearing transcript referred by Mr. Swalwell be inserted in the record. Uh, so ordered. And your record uh, recognized for your closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank Secretary Mayorkas for agreeing to testify before this committee today despite ongoing baseless partisan attacks against him. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you have uh, done a, what I consider uh, a good job at defending this administration given the constraints that you have to operate from uh, in terms of resources. The Secretary's willingness to appear in support of the Department's needs demonstrate his character as a truly dedicated public servant. I'm not sure I can say the same for colleagues on the other side of the aisle who prefer ranting while steadfastly refusing to provide the authority and resources the Department needs. Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't look the brave DHS employees in the face and claim you support them when you refuse to put your vote where your mouth is. Yet, this is exactly what my Republican colleagues have done this entire Congress. It's appalling. DHS only received funding for fiscal year 2024 due to overwhelming Democratic support, just like in 2023. Yet Republicans try to claim that it is you, Secretary Mayorkas, that is undermining border security. This hypocrisy is astounding. The hearing, which was supposed to be about the DHS budget, has become yet another mega border hearing. I did not hear one Republican colleague raise concerns about whether FEMA will have the funding needed to respond to an increasing number of deadly national disasters, nor did they engage with DHS's work to defend against legitimate threats to our 2024 election. Instead, choosing to waste time drumming up anti-immigrant sentiment with unfounded allegations, nor did they want to discuss how the department is responding to domestic terrorist attacks that have left American communities scared and outraged. DHS is tasked with handling all of these issues and more. Yet my Republican colleagues seem more interested in pretending to be outraged than doing the hard work of government. This is sim simply not the way to get things done. It takes complete and utter compromise, like we saw in the Senate, where they drafted a bipartisan bill that would have imposed the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever had. The fact that mega Republicans rejected the proposal out of hand and instead pursued a baseless and unconstitutional impeachment against you, Mr. Secretary, tells the American people all they need to know. The leader of the Republican Party, Donald Trump, bragged about killing this legislation because it would have helped President Biden. Republicans in both the House and Senate have said they will not pass this legislation to improve border security in an election year. Republicans are saying the quiet part out loud. They will not support the department and fix the border because it benefits them politically. Secretary Mayorkas, I appreciate your willingness to engage with this political circus and again, advocate for the needs of the department. The other thing I want to mention is that we didn't get uh, to talk about AI. Uh, Cybersecurity is, uh, as you know, within uh, part of our mission. We share it with a couple of other committees, but it's the new frontier that we have to be front and center to defend all our systems. So I look forward to working uh, with the department on, on our AI defenses going forward. The work that you and DHS employees do is critical. And I want to assure you that it's this committee is still valued by some members of this committee. With that, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I yield back. And thank you again, Mr. Secretary. 
closing statement. Um, before I start, I'd like to clarify a couple of things that, that have been addressed in today's hearing, and, and I'll be brief, Mr. Secretary. Um, you know, the fact that, that immigration laws haven't been updated doesn't mean we don't get to follow the immigration laws on the books. Um, and I, I would agree with you. We, we desperately need some update to our immigration laws. Those don't occur in this committee. That actually happens over in judiciary. Uh, so, uh, I, I mean, I appreciate the, the continual mention that that needs to be addressed, but it, it doesn't obfuscate or even allow a, a variance of any kind in laws that have already been passed by the body. It doesn't excuse um, violation of the law. Um, I'd also like to clarify something that is, and quite frankly, dis, I think dishonest, at least disingenuous, to suggest that because someone or a group of uh, this side of the aisle or that side of the aisle, you know, votes one way or another on a budget, that you're not for, you know, spending money to increase border security. For example, if you vote against a budget that decreases Customs and Border Patrol and then you turn around and vote for a budget that increases dollars for bus Customs and Border Patrol, it is dishonest to say that that side who voted that way voted to cut spending to Customs and Border Patrol. Yet we've heard that multiple times today. That's just flat dishonesty. If that's all you got to say to support or defend the actions at the southern border, well, I guess that tells everybody the truth about what's really going on. Another point I'd like to clarify, someone made a comment that the impeachment hearings earlier were two hearings. It was a 10-month, five-phased investigation of oversight with subpoenas that were never complied with, by the way. Um, so it, this notion that there were two hearings is just false. Um, and about legislation on addressing border security, you know, the process is pretty simple in the Constitution and the rules of the committee in the, or the House and the Senate. You know, we passed the bill. We sent it to the Senate. They could amend it. We go to conference committee. We do that every year on the NDAA. If, that, if the leadership of the Senate really wanted to do something, they would have picked the bill up that was sent over over a year ago. In terms of, you know, the budget discussion today and AI and all this other stuff, multiple members talked about this stuff. I want to make sure I clarify because, you know, you just don't get to say, you know, this happened and this happened in some kind of Jedi mind trick and tell the American people that the, the people here on this side of the aisle didn't talk about AI. Miss Lee talked about AI, uh, about human trafficking. Mr. Garbarino talked about AI, uh, cybersecurity. I mean, it just somewhat infuriating that people just think they can say something that's not true and everybody's going to believe it. Um, so I want to correct the record on that. I have to be candid, your 2025 budget request, I think, undermines our country's ability to, to handle national security. I, I think this idea of cutting Customs and Border Patrol, creating some slush fund that you guys get to decide on your own how to use, is, is really contrary to the whole founding principles of us doing a budget here, sending it to you guys, y'all execute that budget. That was what our founders envisioned. So creating slush funds, that's just, it's against the whole foundation of the Constitution. Um, and so that's why things like that aren't supported in this budget, uh, other budgets that do get voted on and authorizations. Um, underfunding Customs and Border Protection Facilities, I think it's just going to result in an increased flow of migrants across the border. When we catch and release and do those kinds of things, it's a motivation. People come because it's an incentive to come. And I, 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 that's why it's, it's important for us not to see cuts to those. Um, and we know a lot of the dollars in this slush fund are going to do nothing but continue the policies that you've been doing, which is just ushering more people in. I think the interesting number to me, you know, that the, if you look at the curve on known gotaways, as you, pull, as you pull people off the border to process, the known gotaways number actually uh, flatlines or decreases a little bit because... They're not out there to see the known gotaways, right? So they don't, they don't see them because they're not out on the border. They're actually processing people. So I think that unknown number just increases massively. But, I, you know, that's speculation on my part. But it's good common sense. And that's a number we have no clue how big that number is. But we brought it in this committee many times and have shown the videos, you know, from ranchers where 
folks are wearing camouflage. You've seen the carpet shoes, I'm sure, Mr. Secretary, that have been piled up in Arizona, just inside the border, and the backpacks, which we know are full of fentanyl. During your tenure as Secretary, a record number of illegal aliens have crossed into the country, too many of whom have connections, many of whom have connections to transnational criminal organizations. You're from California originally. The, the, the very good reporting on how the Honduran cartels have linked up the gangs in San Francisco uh, and created this nexus is uh, shocking. Uh, it's all happened on your watch. Most recently, uh, of course, and it's been mentioned here, um, an, Ill an illegal alien murdered a college student, Lake and Riley paroled by your department into the country and left a trial of crime in his path. She's just one of thousands of Americans that have been murdered or otherwise victimized by illegal immigrants. The most gut-wrenching part of her murder is that it could have been prevented if you and your administration had chosen to enforce the laws on the books. But that young woman's dead simply because the laws weren't followed. Mr. Secretary, the number of known gotaways I've talked about already, um, that number has trailed off because we're not out on the border looking anymore. I don't want to imagine that that undetected number. It just scares me to death. It seemed to scare Mr. Ray, or uh, Director Ray. Um, he talked about that when he was here testifying. You, you claim that your budget will address the issues we face at our border, but if we look at the numbers, the math doesn't add up to me. FY25, DHS seeks to hire only 350 new Border Patrol agents. I don't think that number is enough, and that's why in all the authorizations we've sent over, it's been significantly higher than that, despite what's been said here today by others who like to misrepresent what really happened. When you testified in the Senate and Senator Capito asked you how uh, you will reach your hiring goals, you couldn't give a sizable num answer. The truth is, Mr. Secretary, morale at DHS is at an all-time low because of the working conditions, and these are your policies that have created that. We've been committed to providing strong oversight to the department, and most importantly, the actions that you've taken as a leader. Uh, we've investigated those policies. We've investigated those failures. Uh, we look forward, and we hope that we can work together on those issues that I mentioned at the beginning, cybersecurity, um, ports, vulnerability of our supply chain. I think a lot of those areas we do agree on. And where there is overlap, where we do agree, we're going to move those things forward as quickly as we can. So I'll look forward to doing that with you and your team. This committee is focused on strengthening our cyber workforce, and I've got a, a bill that I personally am leading and helping put together. We'll get a copy of it to uh, Director Easterly and make sure she gets eyes on it and others from your department. Um, We'll, we'll want your help on that, and I think you'll like the bill that we're putting together. Um, that, that really ends my comments for the day, and again, I thank you for coming. Uh, I understand uh, the emotions of, of, of being here today, um, and without objection, the committee does stand in adjourn.